listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right, here we go again. We're back in the booth at the bomb hole. We got a big episode for you guys today. But first, uh, I got to let you know that the bomb hole is presented by Pub Beer. And second, I got to ask, Stony Buds, how are we doing? So good, my dog. Oh, love hearing that. Now, to my left, we have JP Walker in the booth today. JP, how are we doing? I'm actually really shaky right now. My heart's <laughs> racing. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty nervous, but I'm really glad to be here, and I appreciate you guys getting me on. So, Well... We're really happy that you came and yeah. you're honoring us with coming into the booth. Um, we're going to have a great conversation today talking about everything you've done in snowboarding. And um, I want to say thanks for coming too. Yeah, yeah I thank appreciate you. that. Yeah, thank you. So uh, some of our listeners, which I think is very few, uh, maybe don't know who you are. So I'm going to give a quick brief intro. I wrote a little uh, book report, if you will. But um, yeah, so JP... Pushed the progression of freestyle snowboarding more than anyone for over 20 years, from park to street to backcountry and halfpipe. No one will ever do it like him again. Known as a street snowboarder, JP is actually one of the most well-rounded we've ever seen. He was the first person to do a damn double cork on a snowboard, people. He set the bar for rail tricks. He was the first snowboarder doing textbook front boards, proper back lips, Nose presses on handrails and keeping them straight. Pretzels out, wall rides, grinding fences, gap rail tricks. He has more NBDs, which stands for never been dones, than any rider alive. He's arguably the most iconic pro that snowboarding has ever seen. And there is no arguing that he has the heaviest video part resume out of anyone to ever do it. That's a fact. That's not even up for debate. From Farmington, Utah to the Forum 8, and his constant reinvention of his snowboarding throughout his decades of doing it, JP is, in my opinion, the MJ, the Michael Jordan of our sport. Put some damn respect on his name. This is the first ever bomb hole with John Paul Walker, JP Walker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He's got to be what... <laughs> I don't. I was like, "Who's that person you're talking about?" Because I'm so far away from that right now. It's kind of overwhelming to hear all those stats. So I appreciate hearing them, and uh, it's almost unreal. You know, I've just um, I've had a lot happen for me the last couple of years. So I've just kind of been through a big transformation. So and. I've been kind of distant from snowboarding. I got um, yanked out of it. And I guess just for some context, like I, I think a lot of people know, but my wife was in a really bad accident. She was hit by a truck while she was riding her bike. And she had a traumatic brain injury and was in a coma for a long time and had to have um, brain surgeries and a spine surgery and stuff. So that just yanked me right out of the snowboard world into like a caretaker um, I don't know, someone to come kind of come save the day. So, and I've, and that happened in 2018 and I've kind of been in that space until now. And so, yeah, so this is kind of like, <sighs> the closest I've been to snowboarding. since that happened and um it's overwhelming and uh so i think this is going to be pretty hard for me to to do we'll get through it together yeah and and so yeah if you guys can just uh hang in here with me and i might ask for some support I don't know how that looks yet, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at now and where, like, a lot of this, uh, 
energy and, and emotion that I have is coming from. So I think, you know, kind of a part, a part of me died that day that Roberta got in that accident. And so it sounded like you're talking about somebody else <laughs> on, that <laughs> in, on that intro, dude. I was like, that, that guy sounds like he got some pretty good stats, you know? But um, <laughs> honestly, like, it's crazy, dude. Like, I just, it's just kind of surreal to be in here. And I've, I've seen a couple episodes and stuff. So now to actually be in the chair in here, it's just, it's overwhelming, you know? And and then I think there's one more thing kind of coming up around that that I'd like to share with you guys. Yeah. And I think it's something like like my, I guess my story that I'm making up is, and I don't know if it's true, but it feels like it right now, is that this is kind of the last. <sighs> like the last big thing in snowboarding for me. So it's kind of like this, almost like, not a goodbye, but like, because I'm, I'm still snowboarding, but it's just almost like it's like the last video part or something. This is when you say something about Tom Brady's last game or something like that. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> it's kind Tom of the Brady always keeps coming well, back. Well, that's though. the thing, too. I, I think that sounds like a little bit. Uh, I don't want to devalidate that because it, it, it's. I'm sure it um, is really heavy. And to me, I just think you're so beloved by the snowboard community that I look at it as the snowboarders listening to this podcast just want to hear from JP. You know, yeah, for and sure. We're just having a conversation, and I think that you have, you know, you're beloved. You are beloved by our community. So. Um, there'll always be a place for you to do whatever it is you want to do in this sport. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. There's other ways to, I don't know, reinvent snowboarding and still get, get things out of it. So I don't know. For sure. For sure. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm up for, I guess I'm in a place now where I'm not, not trying to reinvent so much as myself is more just to kind of be myself. And I, I don't really know what that is yet. Yeah. Which is know? great. Right. Which is cool, you know. I mean, actually, I've been doing a lot of different stuff that I kind of have an idea about, but um, we can talk about that, I guess, at, at some point. But, yeah, I just, I think it's just what's important for me right now is to just kind of share where I'm coming from and not try to, I want to talk about all the, the snowboard stuff, but I also don't want to just kind of gloss over what's going on for me i don't think it's really doable for me to just come in here and talk straight snowboarding and yeah. video parts because i've had so much intense stuff happen for me lately so I've, I've spent a lot of time um basically in therapy and doing like some different um retreats and stuff like that to just get support for myself and stuff because i've kind of been living with essentially ptsd from everything that i saw in regards to Roberta's accident and stuff. So it just, it's just hard. It's just different now. I'm, I'm not used to it. Like I'm used to with snowboarding, um, laser focus. Only, only objective is the handrail. And after that one, the one that's bigger than the last one, you know, same with like a jump, just like steady progression. And that was, um, when I was younger, that was super helpful because it was actually um, a big distraction for what was kind of happening for me at home when I was younger. So to to find snowboarding and connect with it and have something I could really like lose myself in and be focused on was was great for 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 being a kid, you know. And um, that's 
you know, that was 25 something years ago and a lot has changed since then. So it's now I'm kind of after my world got rocked with this kind of crisis thing and the, and kind of doing a bunch of therapy and stuff. It's like, I'm suddenly feeling emotions. Like I'm going up and down and I'm just not used to that. I'm used to like JP Walker, the video part, that guy you were talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Adrenaline. That guy has no space for emotion or like any of this stuff, you know? And now, and now I'm open to this whole new range of stuff and I'm just not used to it. So it's like, I'm kind of getting used to it, you know? So it's not like that other part of me is still there. I could definitely like tool that up if I needed to, but it's like, there's this other part of me too. So it's like kind of like a, a deeper, wider part is now kind of available and it's just, it's just weird, you know? Growing uh, as a human huh? with the therapy yeah. and when you're young yeah. and invincible, you just can never imagine how life can actually do that to you and That's i think it. as a kid you need to realize that uh things change as you get older and you're just seeing how life has unfolded for you and dealing with it head on and were you with your wife when the accident happened N no i wasn't and i was actually so i was it was in december and i was here and i was up at the spot at brighton and she was in california in encinitas where we have a summer home and she went out on an early bike ride and i was in the mountains about to start up a fire and like start session on the rails with with my buddy Blair and I just happened to oh he wanted me to fil film a clip of him so I like I didn't have my phone on me I go to my jacket and uh look at my phone there's like all these missed calls and then it's the thing where it does where it kind of um it texts you the voicemail so I could see like the voicemail from like a, basically the emergency room surgeon and I just could only process a few words which was like accident roberta emergency all this stuff and so i, I called the number back like it was the guy's personal number like the er surgeon and he's like he said um your wife's been in an accident like where you need to get over here you know and i'm like okay well what happened he, he's like she got hit by a car and i had it on speaker so me and blair could listen to it and i was like okay uh totally now totally just losing it or like instantly losing it and then basically he said a couple more things about her condition and stuff I can't even really remember but I asked him I said well can she die and he's like maybe yeah. and I'm like in the mountains and up here at, at the spot you know and, and he's like you need to get over here and I'm like I'm in Utah and he's like you need to get over here <sighs> so Luckily, I was with Blair because I was totally, like, totally fucked from that, you know. And, like, we got down pretty fast, and we just hopped in my truck. And he had just got to town so we could, like, hang. So I, it was kind of kind of lame. But um, he drove me, like, straight to the airport. And then I, I was trying to call airlines and stuff and get on the next available flight to San Diego and, like, somehow figured that out, even though it was, like, so challenging with, when you're in shock, you know. And then I just went over and I'm like in my outerwear, like waiting for the plane. And then I'm like, I think I called my mom and a couple other people to kind of tell them what's going on. I'm like, I'm getting on this plane, I'm going down there. She's at a trauma center already, you know? And, uh, I mean, to get on a plane and like, you know, I'm turning my phone off. I'm on the plane in my outerwear, like, just like, you know, when I get off this plane, is my wife going to be alive? And so, luckily, my, my, you know, it was, uh, the accident was super unfortunate, but kind of everything that happened after that, as far as, like, the care that she got was, like, really lucky, like, the, the manner of time she got it in and stuff, like, so she, she had to get an emergency craniotomy, that's when they, like, take your skull off, because you've had, your brain's bleeding, subdural hematoma. And luckily they got her to the emergency room quickly enough to do that. Like the fire department picked her up at the scene, I think, and took her down there and then kind of got her somewhat stable. And then 
they needed they realized they needed to sedate her she was kind of already like going under did the emergency thing so her skull was already cracked so i think they basically just like cut it open and like took it off so that the blood could get out you know and then they scanned her and found out she had all this other damage like a broken back and stuff and a bunch of other stuff and then um so by the time I got there, she'd already had that first procedure and she was up in the uh, ICU and stuff. And luckily for me, my, my cousin, he was actually an anesthesiologist at this Scripps Trauma Center. So he had already kind of figured the whole thing out and got kind of, I was, uh, he met me at the hospital and kind of gave me like the, the green room before I like went into the ICU area, you know? So that was really helpful and they took really good care of her. But from there it was like, they had to do another procedure called a craniectomy. It's when they take your skull off and they leave it off because your brain's going to swell, just like we all know about, like, swollen muscles mm-hmm. and stuff. It's, like, basically like that. So just one thing after another, you know, they're taking her and taking her out, doing these procedures, and they can't do anything about her back yet until her head's stable. And just it was just a lot of stuff every day, and she's in a coma at this point, point you know. So... Yeah, that just, that just really, like, fucked me up, you know, because just to watch that, like, for so many days in a row, for so many hours a day, it just can't help but leave an impact, and it just, it just, I'm super anxious now, I'm afraid of people to get hurt, I don't, I'm just paranoid, I've become this, like, hyper-aware caretaker, like, I don't think anybody can take care of themselves because I think everyone's reckless and going to get hurt. I don't know. Just that's how I filter things now. And I'm trying to, to change that. But when you see that kind of stuff, it just leaves a huge impact, you know, and that's the PTSD. Yeah. And it just comes up like all the time. I just, something happens or I can just like, it's happening again. I I can just get launched back, you know? So. And this is the love of your life, your best friend. This is, I mean, it's such a hard thing. Yeah, for sure. So, and then to have someone, and, you know, she's in a coma and I can't communicate with her. And then at a certain point after they've done all the procedures that they need to do, they they turn off the sedatives and kind of see, like, if she's going to wake up. Because at that point, they don't know if any, you know, they did all their, their part, but they don't know what happened, the damage to her at that point, you know. So that's, like, a hell of a thing to, like... <laughs> They turn it. It's not like the movies where it's like the person kind of comes out of the coma and everyone's there and it's like this big happy thing. It's like they turn the the stuff off and they're like, okay, we'll we'll wait and see, you know. And that's and a couple days go by and she's still basically like in a coma, but there's no sedative. So I'm just like, okay, well, she not not gonna ever wake up, you know. And and at some point, I like. You know, I would I would grab onto her and kind of hold her hands and stuff a lot and talk try to talk to her, you know. But um you know, at one point I was basically like begging her to wake up, like, please wake up, you know. And then like I have this like kind of thing I do where I kind of squeeze her hand a special way, like where I just kind of give her these quick three little things. And I, I was doing that, and I, like, felt that she was, like, doing it back. And I was, like, I'm telling the surgeons and the neurosurgeons and all this stuff, like, I, I she's in there or whatever, you know, but they're just, like, yeah, whatever, probably. <laughs> I don't know, because it was so faint, this, this kind of return thing she was doing for me. But that was kind of, like, the first sign I got that maybe she's going to be able to come out of this, you know, because that was too much of a coincidence unless I was just like manifesting it because I needed some kind of sign but she did come out of it and then from then it was like a couple year rehab basically so I that's when I went the whole caretaker thing really was snowboarding was off the table and I just like dove into that head first and I specifically remember um one time kind of driving down to the hospital where I was like I was like this is what I do now. Like, this is who I am. Kind of kind of the same way I did snowboarding, where I just kind of, like, went all in on it. Like, 
moved everything out of the way, went hyper focused. It's like, no, I, I know how to do that. And that's what I have to do now. But for this situation that me and Roberta are in, and I just like, I just changed, I think on that day. So I'm trying to find my way back a little bit. How is she today? Today she's a lot better. Yeah. So she's been um, surfing. Oh, nice. Yeah, she'll go on like a foam board on like a small day. She has like deficits and and challenges. She has 11 levels of spine fusion in her back. So it's, she can't really move her back much. And she had three brain surgeries in total. So there's like some cognitive things, but not, not anything that, people would maybe really notice but she has challenges but she's like such a hard worker and that's really one of the only reasons why she survived that accident is because she was so fit before and like really active and taking care of herself because if that wasn't the case she probably wouldn't have pulled that off you know so she she's yeah she's trying to get her life back too you know so it's probably hard for you to watch her go back into the world again yeah, man. Being that caretaker. I, I hate it. Like, it's so hard for me to, like, just drop the caretaking and the control. Like, I've been trying to control her, basically, f- since this happened. And in the beginning, that was important because she couldn't do anything. Like, she had to relearn everything, walking and talking and everything. So I needed to be there. And now she's, like, growing up way faster than I'm, like, comfortable with. And I still have all this energy around around the accident and everything that happened and what I saw so it's hard to let go of you know the first time we went surfing I was it was a full like PTSD flashback type scenario you know and And she's an active person she's active yeah yeah. you can't just turn it off right yeah yeah hold her back yeah I I got to a point recently where I kind of had this idea about um surrender really landed hard with me like in the therapy session that I was doing essentially and I just realized that you know this is this is a hard one we kind of talked about this like this is a hard thing for like to tell someone like me that there's no such thing as control because like I don't know like kind of had to have some control to do some of this stuff (laughs) but um but I need to I, I kind of need to drop the control and stop controlling her and just surrender to the whole thing because I can't, it's not realistic that I'm like this knight in shining armor that's going to save her from every catastrophic thing or anything at all, you know. And I was really losing myself in that, trying to stop stuff from happening. And it was just, I was becoming essentially invisible just with my intense caretaking and, and really just fear about this happening again. So... You know, I kind of told her, like, look, I'm not interested in trying to control you anymore. I want you to do the things you want to do, and it's going to be really hard for me, you know. And some of those things I might not be able to even, like, watch because it's just too too gnarly, you know. So, but I got to I gotta stop the control and take care of me, basically. Yeah, that's... That's got to be tough. And and there's something, too, that I think I want to kind of highlight about the whole situation, too, is because obviously, like, what Roberto went through is so fucking heavy and gnarly, and her road is, like, unbelievably challenging. And I noticed that, you know, we're I, – I know we've known each other for a long time. People would ask me, how, oh, how – you know, you talk to JP, how's Roberto doing? How's Roberto doing? How's Roberto doing? But then there's – there not that, not that many people were like, how's JP doing? Right. And, right. and it's like, in some senses that, you know, you kind of just explained it, but it's, it's gnarly for the person that went through the accident, but it's also gnarly for the person who sits by the bedside and has to be there and, and yeah. live through that too. And, and I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems almost like to me now you've taken your approach to filming video parts like that hyper focus, that, that, um, just, just unwillingness to to like be distracted by anything else and you're kind of doing that with like personal development now and it's like you went through this ptsd well now you're you know i'd I'd be stoked if you want to talk about some of the stuff that you've been doing to try to find i guess find yourself again yeah 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 i'd I'd be stoked to tell you about some of that thanks yeah um yeah i i my buddy sean kearns who've produced a lot of these form films and he used to do the whiskey films and stuff he got into some pretty heavy personal growth after some big time stuff happened for him and 
he introduced me to this place called the Haven, which is like a retreat center. It's on Gabriel Island up in BC. And they do programs there where you can kind of go lock in and figure whatever out you need to figure out. And I went there to like a five-day program with Roberta once she was kind of able to, to clear to, to fly. And it was super interesting because I went in there and I, I introduced myself and I'm like, I'm JP, I'm scared. Here's my wife next to me. Like you can see what ha- kind of what happened and I'm just, I'm just scared, you know. And then maybe like three days into the thing when I kind of had some space to work through like a little personal time, I guess I'll call it. What came up for me actually had nothing to do with Roberta and the accident. It was all stuff that had to do with my dad from when I was young. And it was like, that was, I didn't see that coming, you know. But essentially kind of what I found out during that bit of self-awareness work there was um, I really just so badly wanted my dad to see me and see me snowboarding and support me so he was he was an alcoholic and he did not like that I skateboarded or snowboarded and um he would discourage it and stuff like that and I think finding out that how bad that I wanted his like kind of approval and support like that really shined a light on how much um snowboarding kind of filled that in for me because I essentially kind of created this this world where I was in charge you know I kind of made the rules about like what's how we do things in this handrail universe and and snowboard universe and so I got I made myself really safe in that because I was really scared of my dad and by the time I was like in these movies and stuff, he was so far gone with the alcohol, he could never really see that. So I had, like, a big, like, kind of sense of loss and grieving that my dad never saw me. And I I think, like, being able to be part of these films and stuff like essentially like guys like Sean and Mac dog kind of filled in that space for me like these guys were like my dad and so to have that kind of underneath like the driving part of snowboarding of like well I I want these guys are basically my dad my dad can see me now doing this and they're actually stoked on it that was like, that was kind of going on in the background. I don't think I really realized it, you know, but that really kind of pushed me and probably got me to do a lot of shit that I probably wouldn't have <laughs> normally done, you know, because this is like way far outside of just like, I definitely had the passion for snowboarding and progressing snowboarding and was stoked on all that, but there was there had to be something else kind of driving it. It was like this, like longing to be seen by my dad, I think was a big part of that. In addition to the safety it created for me. So I can't, you know, I was always in trouble with my dad. Excuse me. And um, so I was always in trouble with my dad, but I can't get in trouble when I'm like the top billing star in these films. Like this is my world. You, and everyone else have to like submit to it. And these are the rules. Like you can't be tapping your tail on presses. You got to <laughs> square up these board slides, all this stuff, you know? So to, to kind of get that sense of safety, like I don't want to let that go. It, that's what's kind of keeping me do- filming these video parts, I think for so long, because I don't want to lose that identity safety all this stuff that comes along with it and the potential to be seen by I guess people that I could fill in the place for my dad you know does that make any sense no it makes a lot of sense (laughs) like a demon was pushing you almost yeah it is like a demon possession thing because like I don't know this might kind of sound weird but I don't think I'm actually like 
that good of a snowboarder. <laughs> like, there's other guys that are way more naturally talented than me, you know. But I just had, like, this intense desire to, to do it. Plus, I had this demon kind of thing driving me as well that was like, dude, if you're not, if you're not closing out these videos, like, that's, that's like death. You're going to die. You're not going to be safe anymore. There's nowhere for you to go beyond this. So, like, my whole... my whole like sense of self-worth and image and everything identity was has been totally wrapped up in how good of a snowboarder I am you know and if I can continue a little bit more in that vein if you guys are okay no I know I, this is yeah, this is great I have something important I'd like to share about that I just wanted to kind of pause and check with you guys dude of course this is what the bomb hole's about, really. Yeah. And so, moving forward, basically about a year, I went back to that Haven place. So, this would be 2020 in October. I went there for, like, a big self-awareness program, like a 25-day-long program. And so, you're on property for 25 days doing, basically, therapy in a group setting for 8 or 10 hours a day. So, you're going in. And... <sighs> shit um probably like a maybe like a week or something into that program you know i went there I introduced myself the same way jp walker i'm scared my wife's had this accident i'm like have nightmares i'm traumatized all this stuff and then but i didn't i didn't say anything about like i'm this professional snowboarder I just didn't even think to even mention it because I was just not even connected with it at that point you know and <coughs> so on maybe I don't know a week into it I'm kind of starting to get the message that people at this program they like me they think I'm funny I'm connecting with them and They don't even know about any of this. And it was just such a an eye-opening thing because I didn't realize how, yeah, how much my whole everything was wrapped up into how good of a snowboarder I am. And kind of, if I'm not that, I'm nothing. And almost like had a romance about it, about like, I'm only a pro pro snowboarder and that's it all my energy and focus stays in that vein and nothing can deviate me from that and look how cool that is you know and it, and it was cool but it's like it's not really sustainable yeah. <laughs> i mean i'm video parts deep out here and trying to keep running that as like yeah. i don't know not that realistic at a certain point you know so to kind of start to get that message like oh shit like maybe like there's more to me than just being a pro snowboarder was like a crazy thing to kind of to fill and let land. So I'm still getting used to that. And I think that's kind of when this whole thing I talked about earlier about emotion coming into the picture and kind of knocking me out of this, like I'm going high and far and I've been the highest and furthest snowboarder, but now I'm like checking out like the deep and wide version of myself. Mm hmm. Man, yeah. There's, <laughs> do you, want, you want to keep going, or I was going to add? No, go. I I think there's there's um there's a lot of thanks. For, hey, first of all, thank you for sharing that. It's yeah, really, thanks. Really, uh, thanks for listening. Deep and insightful stuff, and yeah. and I think there's there's an interesting thing I want to add too. It's like I think that when you look at the greats, and for better or worse, but when it comes to the greats of any sport, they have to have some something chasing them. There's there's yeah, no there's reason demons. to get that good to get that to be driven to be the best unless you have have somebody chasing you. I, I always say if Michael Jordan went through a bunch of therapy, we wouldn't have fucking Michael Jordan. <laughs> because what what happens? You start to go to a bunch of therapy, you start to realize that you're okay. You start doing a bunch of work on yourself. If you're okay and everything's okay, then if you don't land the back lip, then who cares, right? And but then you don't have fucking like you know, so it's this <laughs> it's this kind of like paradox of like 
yeah, if, if people are totally content and wrapped up with themselves, then the drive to just be the best um, that comes from an unhealthy place at times is, is gone. So I, I think, yeah. I don't know, that's kind of a tangent, but. No, I think that totally fits, you know, and, and I just was never really aware that I had something else driving me till I had this. Unfortunately, it took a crisis to like knock me out of my pattern that I was in and, and a pattern that was like, well supported like i've got you know sponsors and support from the community like like you said i'm I'm beloved and stuff so like why why stop to look like i can just keep re-upping like my deals or whatever you know so i don't want to i don't want to kick out of this but yeah it's like obviously something else is driving underneath that to keep it going and um I'd like to share like a little bit more in that. Yeah, if no, you no, guys we, no, we can keep, that. we can talk about that for three, four more hours. <laughs> yeah. We're good. Well, however long you want yeah. to go. So, so this was, this was pretty interesting. So kind of like in regards to, um, that program, the 25 day one I did the self-awareness one right before I was going to go into that. It's so it's October and my contract with 32 was coming up. And our, our team manager, Brian Cook, was calling me and I like I made up a story that he's calling to tell me he can't sign me up anymore because I just spent the last two years being like a caretaker, not snowboarding at all, you know. So I like was hiding from his phone calls. I was like, I, I don't want to get fired right now, like, you know. And then I he called me right before I was going to go in and I was just like, I'm going to take the call because then he can like tell me he can't do anything for me anymore. And then I can go get support in this group and they can like, I can get down from this somehow, you know? (laughs) And so he calls me and I don't even give him a chance. I'm just like, yeah, I know. I know you got to like me, let me go. I'm, you know, I appreciate you holding me down for the last couple of years and stuff and go into my big story. I made up in my head about how this is going down. And he's like, okay, we want to actually sign you up again for a couple more years. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so the, the reason why I'm telling you that is cause like that was a big thing I kind of found out for me is I do this thing where I make up like a story that's happening and I start running it like it's the truth. And really all I had to do, I could have saved myself a few weeks of suffering if I had just taken his call and listened, you know, and maybe he would have said like, we are letting you go, but at least I wouldn't have had to hurt myself for those two weeks leading up to that. So I go to the program, have that big self-awareness around, oh, shit, I'm maybe more than this pro snowboarder. And some stuff kind of came at me in the program that I didn't really see coming, and it, it led me to want to stay for another 25 days for the next program that's coming. So I told Brian, I'm not going to come back to Utah. I'm going to stay up here. So all those kind of plans we made about preseason and stuff and doing stuff at the spot, I'm not going to be able to do it. So I know you said you wanted to sign me up again, but if that puts that in jeopardy, the contract and stuff, like I get it, but I got to stay up here. I want to focus on this stuff that I'm kind of finding out. I want to try to heal me and Roberta. And, uh, He's so, so he's like, go ahead and stay up there, like, do your thing, you know? And then by the end of the program, I was like, having the, the feeling of actually not wanting to be a pro snowboarder anymore because of the expectations I put on myself around it and the expectations that I think other people have. So I, I kind of, made up my mind to essentially like stop snowboarding not snowboarding but professional snowboarding and I like wrote this text that I was going to send to cook and I came home from the first program had like three days before I was going to go into the next one and I I sent it to him like basically basically I'm resigning is what I sent to him and it was crazy because as soon as I sent it i hit i hit send on my phone i was sitting in my truck like a, i had like kind of the armrest like this i hit send and i physically had this body felt sensation of me like falling backwards like off of a cliff like into like oblivion and i was just sitting in my truck and it was this idea i think of okay like 
you don't want pro snowboarding and that identity anymore, well, we're taking that back. Because that was always there for me, like no matter how, what was going on in my life or how scared I was, like with that stuff around my dad and stuff, I could never really go back any further than this because like snowboarding, the whole community, everything, the identity was holding me, holding me there safe, you know? And so to feel that like get yanked out and it was my own it was my own decision to do so and to feel it like disappear like I grabbed onto my chair like holy fuck like it was crazy and then I was like sitting there for a minute after that happened and I was like okay I'm not dead I guess I can be alive without this it was like an ego death kind of thing you know where I was like there's a way for me to move forward and be alive without the safety or the identity of like JP Walker, the snowboarder. And that was fucking crazy, dude. That's intense. Intense. So that's kind of when we're here now, hopefully that's some context about where I'm kind of coming from when I maybe share these stories and stuff about just know that all that was kind of going on when I'm like squaring up on like double kinks and shit like that. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Holy shit. And baby. and I want to invite you all to take a breath with me. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I'm like <sighs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> There's so much more than you than just snowboarding though. I would have never believed it until and there's so much this. of life left. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. people got to realize when they're young and you're snowboarding that that's just stage one, really. You know, yeah, yeah. There's so much more, and I guess we're all gonna figure it out, and yeah. life's gonna knock us down, and we got to get back up, and right. Everyone's gonna go through some shit for sure, for sure. You could have easily. That's a scenario where you could have easily just turned to drugs or booze or for numb sure. or pills or, but yeah, it's, it takes it takes a lot of courage to look that stuff in the face definitely does and i wish i could have just done it without the whole crisis thing like sending me that way but it's like i don't really think that happens very often you know it usually takes like some big pivotal thing to like get someone to want to sign up for 25 days of self-awareness and then 25 more 25 more of a relationship program that yeah. your partner's at, at it oh, with you oh that was a relationship the, the, one. the second one was a relationship wow. one yeah so that was like i did that you got to kind of do the self-awareness part and then now you the kind of know who you are. Then you can go in for the relationship mm-hmm. one. So that was. And yeah. you could have a partner that's willing that's to right. do that as well. That's right. Yeah. So you're basically a local over there, huh? Kind of. Yeah. They must, <laughs> love, they must love you over there. Yeah. They got my card on file. <laughs> <laughs> they probably got all your little jokes too, all your little funny ways of s- saying stuff. They yeah. Probably picked up yeah. On. They picked up on <laughs> yeah. some of it. Yeah. It was funny. Oh, and, and, and this is kind of interesting too. Like, this is kind of going back to that, but I, this was like. They did kind of get the, like, af- after a while, kind of start to figure out that I was a snowboarder. And I was like, okay, like, but will you guys not go look me up until the program's over? Because I didn't want them to, like, I was so excited about how they were seeing me now and, like, me without all this and how I was being received, I guess, that I didn't want this to contaminate it kind of thing. So I was like, will you guys just hold off a little bit until this is over? And I don't, I don't think all of them really... Uh, consented to that. Yeah, <laughs> you're enjoying not yeah. being JP Walker, the pro. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, it's a lot because all your friends yeah. and everyone you know is around snowboarding. I'm sure, so it's hard yeah. to get out of that. It's hard to get out of it, and it's like I never wanted to get out of it, but it was kind of nice to like enjoy it a little bit and just see, like, you know, really get the message that there's there's more to me than that. It's, you're worth beyond snowboarding. Yeah, because I just didn't really almost see an out of snowboarding at that point. It was kind of like, well, I got. I can like get KO'd on a handrail and never wake up or I can just get buried in an avalanche and that's so that's that's good then at least I don't have to like face any of this stuff and like deal with any of this real shit you know so I I was like and that would just be so glorious and such a sick way to cap off the career you mm-hmm. know just like go down die on the battlefield die on the yeah, battlefield die on like, the battlefield like, you know what I'm saying <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah but that's no food. good for the people around you yeah so. yeah but that's that seemed like that was like those the, were real thoughts that was a real thoughts you know mm-hmm. like this is like this is a way out you know because i can't like 
just like retire or just like whatever film like a shitty part and get like clipped like that's like you put out undesirable too many dope parts <laughs> yeah you're not trying to put out a weak part yeah 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 one thing I, I want to stop and highlight though the first per, first guest we've ever had with byot uh, yeah. so some people are listening they're not watching on youtube so i don't know jp brought his own tissue box so yeah. first, first guest let's slap some respect on that that's what we call an nbd that's an yeah that is an nbd <laughs> I, I logoed it up too yeah. you're yeah. still throwing nbds <laughs> down know, man. it's kind of got a different different vibe to it but it's still nbd yeah straight yeah. up smart move though word yeah thanks for recognizing all right, we're going to take a little break here and talk about some bubs, collagen, protein. Chris, I know you got a fresh injury. What you got going? Yeah, well, Jones, I just uh, obliterated my shoulder, uh, just completed, completely exploded this thing, and I've been chugging collagen protein powder in shake form. I've been putting it in the coffee. I've been trying to get as much down the gullet as I can to come back from this injury because I know you shattered both your legs, and I heard you were chugging bubs, collagen, protein to get back. Yeah, I started chug and I've been consistent on it for two years now. And like it will do to your collarbone, you keep that going, keep it ingesting it. It's going to glue those bones back together. It did my legs for sure. They were in lots of pieces, um, my right one specifically. And I avoided two surgeries that the surgeon wanted to do um, just by taking bubs and getting that bone to grow and getting some material in there so it could remodel and do its thing. So I'm back in it. Lubes me up. Um, my gut's solid. I like it. The stuff's it. proper. Well, the thing is, too, we're just a couple old war dogs out there, a couple right. old battle dogs trying to trying to stay in one piece. And sometimes you need a little you need a little collagen to do that. And I know that a lot of our listeners are probably in the same boat. They're uh, you know basically a lot of a lot of Baja miles on these chassis. So. If you want to keep going, get yourself some Bubs Naturals. Ten uh, percent of all profits go to charity, which is really cool. It's a company owned by a snowboarder named Sean Lake, so that's huge. Snowboarders supporting snowboarders. And lastly, if you want to pick some up, head on over to BubsNaturals.com. Use promo code Bombhole for fifteen percent off. Again, all lowercase Bombhole for fifteen percent off at Bubs BubsNaturals.com. Okay, well, well I got to be clear on one thing because you just kind of breezed over the fact that you sent brian cook the 32 oh, yeah. manager a text message <laughs> resigning right yeah what does that mean yeah thanks for coming back to that so like he basically declined that <laughs> he returned the sender <laughs> yeah which i i really appreciate that he, he did declined that. It. yeah yeah <laughs> I politely declined this text. Return hook. the sender. That's yeah. like when you break up with a, gr a girlfriend and she's like, no, she's we're like, not no. going to do that. Sorry. <laughs> we're still yeah. dating. Yeah. So de so shout out Brian. I mean, because you've done so much. Why, yeah. Why turn your back on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate him for holding me down. He's been like a huge, you know, supporter of me through all this stuff. Like, and even, you know, going back, like when I got off forum, like 32 was my first sponsor that I picked up after I got off forum and that was with Brian and Pierre and everyone at Soltech. So they've been holding me down for a while. And yeah, he was just like, you know, he's like, you know, message declined. Like you just, just stay up there, do your thing. We'll figure it all out later. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he's, 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 I'm still in here, you know, I'm still well, in the chair. I think you got to realize too, you're an icon. Like there's, you don't have to just make video part after video part. Yeah. Just be, you can just be JP Walker. Yeah, I, look at, I get look at that. my resume. I get that, but it's like, and I, I you know, I hear people kind of share that, but it, I didn't really get here with that kind of mindset. So it's kind of hard to like pivot into it at this point. You know, I'm just like, I get a, I get a box of like shirts, just a couple hoodies, and I'm like, I got to get clips in these. You know what I mean? I'm like, I want to, I guess, earn it and support my sponsors and stuff like that. Like I'm not. I'm not trying to, I was, I think I was so afraid of like people viewing me as like a milker or a poser or something like that. Cause I saw guys that were pros like older than me and I was like, man, like I'm better than that guy. He's kind of a, he's kind of washed up. Like that just seemed like the worst thing, you know, I don't want to be washed up. So I don't want to be just chilling. Like, yeah, I'm JP Walker. Check my stats. Like I get to be sponsored kind of thing, you know, so that doesn't really fit, but Thanks for saying. You're so. just a, you're a vet though, <laughs> and it's snowboarding's um, yeah. at a place where I think we can have vets. You know, Word, yeah. skateboarding got there. Well, there's also too. You go on tour. We've been on tour all over the world, and 
the line for JP's yeah. five times as long as the youngest hot boy on the team. And so yeah. people want to like, talk to you. What do you want? want to, like, you. that's the straight up, like he, he's signing autographs for fucking it's his line is like to all the way around the street. <laughs> Everybody else like, they're like, uh, yeah, can you just, I just want to talk to JP. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so I mean, there's, there is, we got 40 Patreon questions and the new kid might get three or four. You right, know? right. So it's right, like, that's yeah. the difference. That's the vet. Yeah. Word. Thanks for saying so. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate. I that. like where you're at, but let's. So we just, I, I, that deep dive was. Thank you for sharing that. That was incredible. Now, yeah. um, I kind of want to change gears and run it back to maybe the early days. Yeah. And the fact that you grew up in Farmington, mm-hmm. Utah, mm-hmm. which is a suburb of Salt Lake, and yeah. I, I don't know what did your what did your childhood look like. I mean, childhood. So I actually grew up in Salt Lake, but I I moved to Farmington, and that's when I started snowboarding. So that is actually when I was was first born. Kind of when, <laughs> <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yep. So yeah, I I skied from a really young age. Like my parents had me on skis, and then I skateboarded. So that was kind of like the foundation right there. I move up to Farmington. I meet uh, Jeremy Jones, Mitch Nelson, Mitch Nelson's brother Nathan, and. They're the only guys in my neighborhood that really skate. Farmington's a small town, you know. So I instantly link with these guys. That was back then. If anyone's on a skateboard, they're automatically your friend, you know. Skating with these guys all summer. Mitch, in his backyard, had, like, um, a bunch of ramps, like some bank ramps and some lawn tramps and maybe a box or something. So I'm over at his house skating all the time, at like, um, just chilling. And then now school starts. It's winter. It snows. I go over to Mitch's house, like how I always do except for there's snow on the ground and all of a sudden he's got a snowboard like I didn't even know these guys snowboarded I I knew about snowboarding but I just had no idea and now he's pulling all his he's putting his launch ramps up launch ramps up in the backyard and he had a little hill in his backyard so now he's just basically doing the same things on a skateboard but on a snowboard and I'm like this is crazy so I I come over with my skis the next day and I'm like this is kind of (laughs) whack i can't really be coming over here on skis you know it's just skis and like wooden lawn tramps just whatever i don't need to yeah yeah. (laughs) not a good look (laughs) maybe a spread eagle why not yeah (laughs) so um i'm like yeah i gotta get a snowboard you know and a kid a kid that kind of lived closer to me had one i borrowed and there happened to be a hill by my house too and it was, I think it was one of those burn boards that didn't even have, like, a back binding. I, like, went down the hill a couple times on that. And then pretty soon I was, like, asking my mom for a snowboard for Christmas. And I was still going over to Mitch's house and probably, like, borrowing his, his their boards between their runs in the backyard and stuff, trying to get it in, you know. But uh, pretty quick I, I got a board for Christmas. I might They might have even given it to me before Christmas because I was just begging for it kind of thing. And from then I was just literally at mitch's house like every day after school like back then it snowed a ton you know and he kind of lived in the foothills a little bit in farmington and i just like learned from him and jeremy and brandon bybee was was a kid from farmington too and then these two other kids uh mark bell and chris hayes they were really good snowboarders would all just link up at and mitch's backyard and practice and that's when i started seeing snowboard videos like these guys had videos and stuff so I was just totally like, this is insane because I, I used to ski and I skate and this is kind of like this melding of both and my buddies are doing it like I'm in, you know. So I had to, those guys were already pretty good. Like I think they could, Mitch could do like 540s and stuff already. So I had to like up the game here pretty quick, you know. And uh, I remember I uh, I went to a different school than those guys because I lived a little further north but plus i was in like a alternative high school like a bad kid high school where you could go out and like dart up between class <laughs> <laughs> and um my school got out like a little bit earlier than those guys because that's just like a privilege i guess you get when you're in alternative high school you know you don't gotta go as long so i would i would <laughs> and you can smoke <laughs> and you can smoke <laughs> Let's not forget. Yeah. So I was like, and I was kind of like headed that way a little bit. Like I was like playing around smoking and like, I was like probably drinking and trying and doing drugs a little bit, you know, and that's what landed me in the alternative school. But it's like, as soon as I got in there and it was kind of around the same time I found out about snowboarding, I was like, okay, I can either go this way or I can go towards Mitch's 
house, Mitch and Jeremy, where they're not doing this stuff and they're snowboarding more. That was like a clear like path in the road. I'm like, I want to, I want to go the snowboard way, you know? So I like stopped all that kind of stuff and just locked in with those guys. And then I would wear my snowboard boots to school. Cause if I did that, when my bus dropped me off at home, if I ran up to my house and grabbed my snowboard, cause then I had to walk like four miles to Mitch's house. This is like the classic, like old, old guy story back in our day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> if I did that, I would get to his house, <clears throat> uh, just like right at the same time as his bus dropped him off and his bus dropped him off right in front of his house. So I'd be, yeah, get off the bus, go grab my snowboard, run to Mitch's house, get there. And I'd walk to like the back of his yard where the top of the hill was. And I'd like throw my board down to strap in and I'd like look up and his bus would be pulling up and be like running to catch up, you know? <laughs> so that's how, like, into it I was. I was like, dude, I can't even afford to go up and take the time to put my boots on because that's just going to cost me, like, one run down this hill that Mitch might get that I might not, you know what I mean? So I was <laughs> I was in like that, you know? Hey, I have a, I have a great uh, segue right here. I spoke with your mom, Pam Walker, for oh, a while. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I happened to get... A guest question. Oh no! From your mom. Oh, whoa. Pam Walker. Let's give her a big old air horn first. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of right along the lines of what we're talking about. I think it's pretty good. Pa- Pam Cox. No. Oh, it's Pam Cox. Pam Cox. Sorry. Cox. Sorry. Uh, yeah. All good. I, my All bad. Good. Sorry, Pam. All good. Okay, here we go. Hey, JP. It's your mom. Um, I think um, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, visiting your school counselor. I think your snowboard community would like to know uh what happened in that meeting and uh also i think they might like to know uh how your parents felt about uh your career choice you guys are pretty misty with that one that's sweet (laughs) (laughs) nice work digging out that digging that good surprise um yeah that's that's funny she's she's bringing that up so she went to like a I guess I'd kind of already declared to my school counselor, like, I'm going to be a pro snowboarder. And she went to, like, the parent-teacher conference thing, and that kind of, like, came out in the meeting, like, that, oh, JP wants to be a pro snowboarder. My mom was just like, that's not even a thing back then, you know what I mean? So that was kind of the first time that she had heard about it, and everyone was like, my mom always kind of tells me now, she's like, when I first heard you say you want to be a pro snowboarder, I just kind of like rolled my eyes like whatever. So basically you want to be like a homeless bum. You know what I mean? (laughs) That's what she heard, you know. But I was like super, super clear in what I wanted to do and stuff. So she was always really supportive. I think she was definitely scared of like what that meant because it just didn't look like the typical thing, you know. Back then it's like a, a pro snowboarder didn't even really, probably couldn't even really make a living anyway, you know. So I have a lot of respect that she didn't like try to challenge me or like deviate me from that. She kind of just like held that uncomfortableness. I think she had around that and just supported me as much as she could and let, let me do my thing. So shout, shout out, shout out sidebar. She also (laughs) said, uh, tell JP, I love him a lot. Oh, (laughs) I love you too. It wasn't a job (laughs) back then. We were looking up to 18 year olds. That's what I'm saying. And our parents are like, you're basically thinking uh, until you're 18. And then what's life after that? Yeah. Like, what are you going to do when you're 40? You know, where, where does life go? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's just such an interesting, like lesson in retrospect. It's like, that's the ultimate thing is like, well, I'm here now. I'm present here in this moment now. And if I'm trying to think about something when I'm 40, that's just going to, become such a problem for what i'm actually doing right now but it's like the focus i'm here present now snowboarding that's my desire i'm going to put my energy towards that then it's actually doable if it's like i'm going to do this but i'm kind of also worried about 40 years from now i don't know i don't think that's going to really play in my experience in her mind she's that age so she's like totally she's thinking of her present yeah. Now you mentioned you had crystal clear clarity on what you want to do. I want to know like what that clarity was and how things evolve for you. Yeah, I just like I mean there's all that stuff running underneath, but I just like I was watching videos, so I knew that there was like space for this stuff to happen and I really just wanted to be in a MacDog production video. So I think you know the 
first video I saw was Critical Condition, which was like a Fault Line Films movie, and that was really cool. And, and I was instantly gravitated to Noah Slaznik because he was just to- looked totally different than the other guys, like different style, totally skate influenced. And then shortly after that, I saw Hard Hungry and the Homeless, which is like probably my favorite video, Mac Dog, Produ- Mac Dog Productions. And the dudes in that were just like on some next level shit, you know? Like I just couldn't even believe what I was seeing. Like the they're riding anything but snow. And that was just so compelling to me. Like you don't have to ride snow on this. I, I think I really just had like a kind of counterculture or like I need to do a different kind of vibe. Like I don't want to conform to what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to be a pro snowboarder. I'm supposed to go to college, whatever, do all these things. And now here these guys are snowboarding, but they're actually like, even inside of snowboarding, they're doing something totally wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're riding fucking whatever, you know, handrails and cars and shopping carts and all this stuff. I was just like, dude, this is, I was just so gravitated to that. And I just wanted to embody that and, and do that myself. So I just put all my focus into to whatever it was going to take to do that. And, um, I mean, pretty quick got sponsored. Um, I guess like I was sponsored by salty peaks first, like the shop. And back then that just meant like, they don't kick you out of the store when you're in there bugging them. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like Brad Chaffel worked there. So there was like homies there, you know? Yeah. Shout out Brad. And then, uh, and then this dude, John Schisler, he wrote for this uh, company called Standard, which was like a Huntington Beach brand, or they're kind of from Southern California somewhere. And he was a Brighton local, and he just saw me writing. Like, this is how it went down back then. Like, he just came up to me one day and said, hey, like, Standard Snowboards, I ride for them, and they want to put a new guy on. And I've seen you cruise in the slopes, and I think you should be on the team. And I was like, all right, word. Like, let's do it, you know? And then they sent me like two boards and a contract that was like probably like this long (laughs) and uh next thing you know I'm sponsored so this is like my first year out of high school so I was kind of like I had it in my head like I basically have this one year out of high school where it's kind of like this gray area before like I start getting a ton of heat from like probably family and just world pressures to like go do something and so halfway through the season I'm getting hooked up you know I'm coming back to Mitch's house still because they were a year younger than me. So he's in school and like, he's, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm sponsored or whatever. I got these boards in the mail today. It's crazy, you know, to like be getting snowboards sent to your house. And they were not good snowboards. Like, <laughs> they, I can only imagine. They were just like, I got them and I was like, instantly like the skill just dipped. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> like, I don't worse. know if, I don't know if I can do this. Cause <laughs> I just like, I just felt my shit drop off, you know, strapping into this thing. And Jeremy was already, he was already hooked up a bit you know because he was like kind of out of school like a year before me so he was already like making moves and he had a probably a couple sponsors i think he wrote for twist and i can't remember actually his chrono what his sponsors were but eventually him and mitch got on rev snowboards which was like a canadian brand and they had like the channels in the board they were the first one to do the slider system for the binding mount and um I was still on standard. Those guys were starting to do trips and stuff for rev. And then standard was starting to fold. And so they just swooped me up. Like, obviously like my boys had my back, you know what I mean? So now I'm on the same team as Mitch and Jeremy. Tim Osler was on it. JF Pelshat. And uh, I shout those guys out and a couple other Canadian dudes were holding it down. So it was a pretty good squad. And then, uh, yeah, right away we started doing trips and then really the, you know, we filmed a little bit locally with, like, uh, BC Films, like Chesky and uh, J.C. Brady. Mm, Chesky. But the, the first big one was um, Kingpin. So Whitey had come to town, and he moved to town with LeBlanc. And I think I was just riding, like, kind of, like, side country, like, Mary Shoots area one day, like, back when it snowed a shitload. Me and Mitch were, like, over there, and Mikey was trying to actually film, like, a little cliff line with whitey and we were kind of sitting below i think we had some bit of an idea who mikey was like i knew about those kingpin videos because i watched like caffeine and hard pack and all those ones and uh but i didn't know whitey was out in utah now but i kind of had an idea about leblanc and then he like hit this cliff and he basically like rode right up to me and mitch and was like you guys want to film for kingpin like 
I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, it was just kind of weird <laughs> when I'm thinking about it now, you know, like he's in the middle of filming and then he like lands his cliff and comes over and just like pulls up and is like, you guys want to film? Like, yeah, sure. He'd obviously been peeping your tapes around. I guess right, he'd been yeah. peeping tape. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and then it was funny cause I was so, as much as I wanted to get into that space, I was also still really like, uh a purist about it and kind of like no like I snowboard for me and kind of had a bit of that kind of thing going you know and so the so it was basically like Whitey's like um okay we'll meet us up here tomorrow to film you know and so it was me and Jeremy and Mitch and, and probably Mikey and maybe somebody else that was on that crew we're going up the lift and me and Jeremy were on our own chair like separate from Whitey and, and Mikey and we're like dude, this is such a sick pow day. Like, are we really going to stop and go film right now? We're like, nah. And we jumped off the lift, like on crest to, and just, just peaced out. <laughs> so if you can imagine, like <laughs> I just got invited onto set and I'm like, nah, I'm dipping because this pow is good. Me and Jeremy like dipped, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they were behind you in the chair. They're in front of us. In front. So I think, I think they're in front of us. So like, they didn't even see, we're just off. We didn't even like link with them for the rest of the day, you know? <laughs> They eventually, get up at the top, and they're like, "I swear they got on right yeah, behind us." Yeah, yeah, yeah. We eventually, obviously, like linked up and started filming, and then I filmed uh, that year. Filmed Warriors Kingpin Productions. Was that the Rev commercial? That had the Rev commercial in it. Yeah, the so Dukes of Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, that was that was dope. really fun. Yeah, Whitey was like so good at all that stuff and so creative. Like we like went and bought those cars like downtown from like a used place and like just drove them back all totally illegally found like a dirt lot by our house rattle can spray painted them like in our driveway <laughs> and just went and like drove them and jumped them and crashed them and stuff and he like he had all that going on up here so that was cool for us to like link up with him and and then he had the mag too with a uh, blunt right yep so it was so that was cool because we were just getting like local exposure there wasn't like big we didn't have like back then we didn't have a budget to go travel around or whatever but so with him being in utah that was really kind of jump-started us into like bigger productions and stuff like that and then after that you got it was what was the next whitey video uh, uh king king chronicles, chronicles yeah yep yeah so we did that one and i was so by then i i got the call to film with mac dog so actually for Kingpin, I, fil I filmed kind of like a half part and I also filmed the MDP part that year and that was Simple Pleasures. So kind it was kind of like when I was in Utah, I would film with Kingpin and then I'd do trips with Mac Dog to go shoot for Simple Pleasures. And that, I want to tell you about how I hooked up with those guys. You guys down for that? Way That's down. what we're here for. I don't yeah. want to <laughs> jump too far ahead. No, no. It, that was, so. so I was on special blend already so i got hooked up with special blend i think mathis kind of hooked that up because he was already shooting maybe like bump or some of those dudes that were on special blend and so i got like shout out rob mathis shout out mathis yeah so somebody got me like lined up with blend and then that's obviously was under four star distribution which they started um forum and and foursquare and later circa and Back then they did like a, like kind of like an on snow trade show. I don't know if you remember that stone. But I do. Yeah. So they were doing those. The one in Utah, right? It was in Utah. Yep. Yeah. So Forum was coming to town to like pop off their new stuff. Like they had samples and it was like, it was already like Peter and Duffacy and Bjorn were on. And then my Kingpin part, like my uh, Warriors part had already dropped. And that was, I had a closing part in that video and it was like pretty, pretty hard, I guess, you know? And so, um, that's so weird. It's so Your hard for me to say part that. Closing part in a uh, Whitey movie is a big deal. <laughs> I know. I just kind of had a hard time even like acknowledging myself in that, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to shout myself out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my team manager for Special Blend hits me up and he's like, Mac Dog's in town. Um, we want you to go film with him, you know? And I'm like, all right. So I. And he's like, and, and we're doing Forum. Like, I kind of had heard Forum was starting. He's like, come get come get a board and try it. And Rev was kind of on the rocks at that point. Like they were kind of in trouble. And so I was like, okay, well I'll come try a board. And actually those Rev snowboards were like the best boards. Like really? they, they were so good. They were like next level good. Like that's a board. Like I got on, you like rode better. You yeah. Know? 
like crazy. I don't know what's going on. You like the slider pattern? I like the slider. I could get like the perfect stance. Like mm. everything about it was good. I actually, I think later I heard that they went out of business because those boards cost like 600 bucks <laughs> to make and they were selling them for like for five. whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, so that might have been a factor. We're losing $100 every yeah, board. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Good business ball. So I went up. They had like an on snow thing at Solitude and I grabbed like a forum board from my team manager, Steve Ruff, who was the special blend team manager. Shout out, Steve. And I pick up this like Peter line pro model thing and I like go take it over to Brighton and mount it up. And I like go to like traverse across uh, like the Millie bowl to go like into the Mary shoots, you know, can't even get across the fucking bowl. It was like, the board was so bad, so <laughs> bad. I was just like, I, ca I can't believe this. Like, I'm like <laughs> no I, nose rolling on like little pump bumps on a traverse, you know, it was crazy. I have a Patreon question. Okay. And uh, do you want to talk about Patreon real quick? Sure, yeah. Our uh, Patreon members, you know, along with our sponsors and and people that support us buying merch, but our, our Patreon is a huge supporter of the show. And uh, so we're kind of a podcast funded by the people. So if you, if you enjoy this podcast and want to support it, you can sign up for our Patreon. There's a link at bombhole.com. We have a link. Make it really easy to sign up. And then you get to ask a question like this person. And uh, who are they? What are they asking, bud? This is Isabella Snow Monkey. Good name. Please tell us about the early forum board quality and the fact you guys were still able to get shit done with boards delamming and blowing edges. Yeah, man. I mean, I think that's the thing is it was kind of <coughs> no secret that those boards weren't great. And that, in a way, I guess, just kind of speaks to, like, the level I was kind of operating under, which is, like, I don't care what these boards are, like, what any board's like. I'm going to I'm gonna rip, you know? There was, like, a, a quote in a trans world maybe back in the day that said something about, like, if, you, if you're really good, you can rip on an ironing board. And that, like, really landed with me. And I was like, okay, well, this is obviously – even probably not as good as an ironing board. <laughs> <laughs> an ironing board might have been better. Yeah, but I'm gonna like I'm gonna I'm gonna go, you know. So I like rode the board and it wasn't good. And then I came back the next day and kind of reported. I'm like, yeah, the board's not that good. And then and then Steve said, well, Mac Dog is coming to town, or he was already in town, but he's like, those guys want you to come film with them tomorrow. Um, can you show him around, you know? And he's in town with Peter Lyon and Joey McGuire. And Peter Lyon's like, dude, I'm, I love Peter Lyon. Like, shout out Peter Lyon. Yeah, huge. <laughs> like, huge, huge influence, you know? And uh, they're basically kind of telling me, like, this is... The way I heard it is, like, this is tryouts. Like, Mac Dog and Peter want you to go with them to, to film around here. Like, this is your home turf. Like, show them around, you know? So I instantly, like take my bindings off the forum board and mount up that rev board. <laughs> 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 and I go, we go up to, to Grizzly and we, we just hike up one of the gullies right there and build like a little side thing and start filming. And those clips are in my simple pleasures video part. You can see like I'm on a rev snowboard in there. I do like a front rodeo five tail grab and that then clip's so sick. and then a front seven, I think uh, rodeo. And that was, I might have done something else that day and Peter had like maybe a front seven or something. And I think we went and hit another jump too, but basically like I had like a good day. Like I landed both those tricks, maybe first try. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what would have happened if you rode that forum board up there. That oh, day. I, would, I would have been <laughs> failed tryouts. Yeah. Yeah. I would have <laughs> failed. Yeah. So, but I could not sleep that night before. Cause that's just how I was like, dude, this is my shot. Like I love these Mac dog videos. I love Peter Lyon. Like they're starting a new thing. Like, it couldn't be any more pivotal, like all those things coming together. I'm already on special blend. Like it's part of the, the whole thing. Like it's like if I can't get on forum, then what's up even my future at special blend? You know what I mean? So it was, it was all there, you know? And uh, I remember like I pulled up in like the kind of parking area at Grizzly and I'm like, I'm like booting up. I'm obviously there like way earlier than they said to me, you know, because I'm just stressing and I like, this car pulls up. I don't even know what they're driving, but I'm like looking in the rear view and I see this dude get out and I could just tell. I'm like, that's Peter Lyon. I'm like looking in the rear view through my car across the parking lot. I'm like, that's totally him because I was just so studied on, on him, you know. I didn't know anything about Mike, about Mac Dog, but like this other guy gets out. I'm like, guess that's him. So now I'm just like, okay, let, I just roll up on these guys. Like it was super weird, you know, but I just pulled up and I'm like, hey, I'm JP and... 
I guess I'm going to show you guys around. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know where you were taking them? No, I just knew that, like, I think I had it in my head that, like, we should go to Grizzly Gulch instead of Brighton because there, around that time there was something about, like, Grizzly Gulch is, like, a level up somehow than Brighton. Like, Brighton's the resort, and there's, like, stuff you can do. But if you want to, like, step your game up, you got to, like, get into Grizzly Gulch. Get into know? the Gulch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it landed the landed those couple tricks. And then that night, I'm like, those guys are all in town for the trade show, and they hit me up. They're like, my team manager, Steve, hits me up. He's like, hey, sounded like it was a pretty good day up there. Mac Dog says you're a stomper, and they want you to come over to the hotel tonight and have a meeting and, like, come to dinner with us, you know? And I'm like, all right. Like, and I didn't even really put that together too much. And I was actually super committed to rev at that point because i love those boards and jeremy and mitch tim everyone was still on the team and it was this little squad you know roberta wrote for rev too so there's that and um so i go over they're downtown at a hotel i come in they have this meeting and they're like basically propositioning me to get on forum you know and it was mac dog and peter and I think Raul Reese, who is one of the other owners of oh, it. Oh, Raul was there. Yeah, they were all in town, you know. And I kind of like ice grilled them on it a little bit. <laughs> I was like, told them kind of what I just told you. I'm like, I'm stoked on Rev, the team. I'm about my homies, like, and I don't know about these boards, you know. And then they just kind of hit me with a bunch of stuff. Like, we're going to get the boards made here. And they, I don't remember exactly what. The list was but essentially i made up this like list of 10 lies they told me about like all the shit they were gonna do that kind of like to convince me to come on board but one of them was like yeah better boards like private half pipe at mount hood like all these different things you know and i'm like all right sounds pretty good and like i'm not sure like let me kind of sniff up around with rev a little more and find out what's going on so i didn't like totally bite right away and and part of that probably was because mike was like mac dog said whether you do it or not, I still want to film you. So I was like, all right, word. Because that's that was the main thing that I wanted was, like, to be in one of his films. Was he involved with Forum as an owner? Yeah. He was yeah. originally. So he was, so it was, like, he was supposed to kind of be the whole media backbone part of it. And then Peter was obviously, like, the spearhead writer, and he did a lot of the designs. And then there was, like, the distribution guys from Four Star that had the other part. And I don't know if you remember Greg DeLeo, but mm -hmm. he, he came over from Division 23 with Peter. So Greg DeLeo, DeLeo was part of it in the beginning as well. And Raul was a quick talker. Right. And he was a quick talker, and he already had bland pop and good. And then they were starting Foursquare at the same time, kind of like they probably had like Foursquare samples and stuff, but hadn't really announced it yet, you know? So it was all, all coming together, you know? And I think... Pretty quick, I, I probably went went back to Rev and talked to my team manager and just said, um, "These guys are hitting me up. Like, what's the deal? You know?" And I and, it, and this was Ben Pruis. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but mm -hmm. and he, I think he pr pretty much said, "Like, yeah, I probably should do it." You know. So once I had that kind of green light, I just hit him back up and I was like, yeah, "I'll do it." You know. And then I started panicking because I had to ride those boards. <laughs> <laughs> But from there, I, like, just kind of, like, linked up with, you know, I f at that year I filmed a lot with Kurt Heine and not so much with Mac Dog, but um, I kind of got on a lot of trips with him and Bjorn, just kind of along for the ride, really. Like, I hadn't really traveled much for snowboarding and I didn't really have much experience shooting outside of, like, what I did with Whitey, you know, and a lot of that stuff with Whitey happened here in Utah locally, you know, so... Now I'm on trips, I'm driving around, I'm basically like Kurt Heine's like hostage because I'm just like this 20-year-old or 19-year-old kid, you know. And that's uh, that's why I ended up sliding across that pole. That's what I, I want to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, or the wire. The wire. That was fully like I'm staying at Kurt Heine's house in Hood River and that, that wire that goes across at Timberline, it's next to that jump we call the dirty kicker or the dirty step down. Yep. And I had clips on that in simple pleasures i think like switch back three and switch for inside five or something like that mm -hmm. and uh so that that was in like the next gully over and kurt was saying like oh you could like ride and then grab onto that and go across and i'm like yeah whatever you know i'm staying at his house and he's like now he's like in the kind of his kitchen like tinkering with this like 
Lexan type plastic and he's like riveting it onto gloves, you know, just starts this whole project for me. I don't even know it's for me, you know? And then he's like, try these out. And like, you're going to grab onto the thing and slide across. I'm like, I am. I'm like, I guess I am. Cause I'm kind of like a hostage, you know, <laughs> I gotta, <laughs> I gotta do what these guys are, are saying, you know, like I knew Kurt, like I saw him in Mac dog video. So it's like, here's this guy. He's like, was a pro snowboarder. He works for Mac dog. Like I kind of have no say, you know, he fashions up these things. He had like a carabiner on it. So it was like when I grabbed the wire, I was supposed to do it in a way that like the carabiner clicked through so that I would be st stuck on the thing. So I couldn't fall off, you know? And then that had like a thing in my jacket, like another thing that was kind of tied to like a harness, I think. So if I did let go or those gloves kind of failed somehow, I would, wouldn't fall because that thing was high. And then there was like a wire or another thing hanging from me because it had like this big sag in it. So I was like, I'm not going to get across. And then it's just like, so next thing I know, I'm up there like riding next to this wire and I'm grabbing on trying to click it. And like, I'm, I, I think I didn't get the beaner on quite right. So I was like, but now I'm like kind of committed. I'm out there. So I'm like trying to click it on and then I'm just on for the ride. <laughs> Wow. It was pretty wild. And then I get stuck in the middle, obviously. Yeah. So now I'm hanging. Yeah, the clip ends when you're just in the middle. Yeah. So no one, no one knew what happened after that. Yeah, I'm just hanging there trying to like hold on because I didn't want to let go and kind of come out of the gloves and see if this whole safety system worked, you know, because it's high and it's flat. So I'm like hanging. And then they got their filming. It's from so far away because it's like this big feature. They got to come running over and grab this thing and pull me across to the other side where it's like sh like lower where I can get off. So I did get off, but, like, the kid's grip strength was, like, Holy it was, like, sweet. next level. That's crazy. Yeah. So glad you – I had a note to talk about the simple pleasures. Yeah. Yeah. It cable was, slide. Ta cable slide, yeah, so. Okay. And so, yeah, that's – and then the next one is yeah. – I, mean, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but decade. Yeah, decade. Uh, well, there's kind of something important, actually, I think I want to talk about that happened with – um filming simple pleasures yeah. and that was so i'd shot mostly with kurt heine and then at the end of the year it was probably like may and we're like mac dogs like we're gonna go up to ak and get in a heli and go but but not go do lines go <coughs> build kickers you know so i i go up to alieska with peter and mike and we hooked up with like a couple local guys up there and next thing you know we're just like in a helicopter into the backcountry to build jumps you know it's like a new heli operation, and so no idea about any of this stuff. And we go back there, and we just kind of, like, scan an area. Like, that area looks like there's, like, three or four areas to build a jump. Like, we get dropped off. So now we're kind of totally – it's not like sledding where you can go sniff around and find stuff. It was totally eyeballed from the heli, and now we're, like, pulling up on these big features we saw from the heli that are, like, 20 times bigger, obviously. <laughs> and so we kind of – we hit a couple things – there's a couple shots in my part, like from that area. I think I had like a switch nine and maybe a switch back five off these kind of wind lips. And then we get down to the jump. That's the, this box cover jump for simple pleasures. And uh, it's this big hip with like the landings, like endless, like it's so long, you know, and we pull up on it and me and Peter are kind of up on the runway area and Mac dogs like down at the bottom already looking for angles. And he like calls us on the radio and he's like, he's like, Oh, um, I think this other local guy with, he hit it with no jump and went super far. Like he was, he was like this local Alaskan kid that was trying to probably get his shot in, you know, went like 200 feet on it. It's in the credits. I think his name is Dan coffee. I'm tripping on this dude. Cause he's riding like a 180, just pointing it off everything. Like, and th and then, he flies off this hip and then Mac Doc calls up on the radio and is like, Peter, I think we need to stop and take our time with this jump because this is the biggest jump we've ever been to, like ever in Mac Doc history. And we need to build a we need to build a proper booter on this thing. And I'm like, damn, dude, like I'm fucking tripping. This jump's huge, you know? And now I'm like in the in the gut of it, like winging up a highway on it to to build it, you know? And I remember um that moment was like, I had this thing of like, okay, hold on a second. Like, this is not Brighton anymore. This is not Mitch's backyard. 
this is kind of something totally different and I'm scared and like, I don't know if like I'm up for this. It was, it was just like the safety thing that I think I was kind of getting from snowboarding was now suddenly kind of being threatened from like, or my safety was being threatened from the thing I created. Like, whoa, this jump's fucking gnarly. Like I could get hurt maybe or something, you know? And it took a lot for me to, I remember I just like, dude, I just, I'd so much rather be home at Brighton just taking laps with my buddies. Cause that's fun. This is something else, you know? And luckily I ended up hitting it. I had like that big front three. I think it was probably maybe my opening shot in that part. And I hung in there and fucking hit that thing. Cause that was a, that was a point where I could have like been like, dude, I'm not up for this. So I think that's important for me to share because that was the first time I really got uncomfortable with like the size and the, that, the aspect of like these kind of bigger features, you know? So were you getting heli laps back up or they oh, just left you there? Hiked it. So th- this jump is so big. The hike is like 40 minutes between by the time you like each time pretty much. Mm. Yeah. They just dropped us off and the guide was tripping because he was like, we could be getting power runs and first descents. And now here's like these like little snowboard rats trying to like hike a jump and build they couldn't even understand what we were yeah, doing. Like, what you know? are you doing? <laughs> we're, we're in Alaska, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So that's kind of a sidebar, but I that was a, kind of important for me to share. Um, no, that that's a thank you for sharing that. That's huge yeah. to hear. And I I, I want to highlight it where we're at with the snowboarding because in going to doing my research for this too, I went back and watched all these parts and and there's also you know we're gonna get into decade and I feel like you know simple pleasures. Decade, tech diff, resistance, that kind of period of time was some of the most rapid progression snowboarding's ever seen. And it went from board slides that just just fucking get on the thing and hope you make it to the end and doesn't if you come close, we'll throw it in the video to like, you know, fast forward decade, um, you know a lot of the, the first ever tricks done well. Good mm-hmm. back lips. Mm-hmm. The back lip fakie on um, mm-hmm. yeah. the M- rail. M- M- Mueller Park. Mueller Park. Yeah. The back lip fakie. Like, that was the best back lip ever done. Word, thanks. You know, at that, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, up until that point. But yeah, the, you yeah. know, so and anyway, I want to, you can you can take it from there, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, so that I agree with you that there was a, like a big block of progression that happened in that window of those, those couple of films. And I think, I mean, my perspective or I guess my part that I can say about that is you know so I'd film the simple pleasures part kind of like legitted myself and now I'm still on with Mac Dog. they want to film me again I'm on forum I'm about to have a pro model come out and so I was like you know I want to actually do more handrail type snowboarding because that's what a lot what I was doing in Mitch's backyard would set up little things and like jib on them and stuff because that's what I saw in that hard hungry and homeless video was like anything but snow so I, that was still like really deep within me but when it came to simple pleasures I kind of felt like I had to do what I had to do to get in hence why I'm hanging from the cable you know <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm like feeling I think more confident in like stepping into the direction that I wanted to take it because at that time like handrails were were frowned upon like anything like that it was like the kind of the older generation was like clowning it and saying it was whack or you're a wannabe skater all these kind of things you know so it was pretty much dead like the guys like um Nate Cole Dale Rayberg and Rowan and those guys that were up on all that shit heavy shout out to those boys they um they weren't really doing it anymore so it was like this like dead spot happened in it I was like, dude, I'm still so so connected to that. I want to like bring that back. So I, and this Mueller Park handrail was close to where we live, where I lived in Farmington. So that's actually the rail that I learned to handrail on. So if you can imagine like, like that's like a 17 or 18 stair handrail. It was up in this little canyon. So it kind of always had snow at it. So we could go there after school and learn tricks on it. It was buried, so it was just like a bar on the ground. It wasn't like the stairs were out or anything, but I like knew about that handrail. Already had some moves on it. Like I probably front boarded it and maybe board slid it or something, you know. And then now Mac Dog's coming to town again to film. Like, and I think actually the snow wasn't that great. We probably filmed around Brighton and did some other things. And I'm like, well, there's 
there's handrails, you know, and he was pretty receptive to it because obviously he had already shot a bunch of that stuff. But maybe kind of like a little bit, I don't know. And so we went to, to Mueller Park, and uh, I think I kind of had this idea of if I'm going to get these guys on board with me, I got to, like, do something next level, like something they haven't seen, something that nobody's seen to kind of convince them of this is dope, you know. I can't just inch on to, like, a log or something and say that's, a, that's good, you know. So I knew about the handrail. I already hit it a bunch. I take Mac Dog up there, and he's like, it's got, you know, it's covered in snow. So that's when the whole first thing started with chipping the snow out to make the stairs show. So I think he started digging it out, and we could see that it was, like, looking pretty gnarly. And he just gravitated to that, like, got to dig these stairs out to make this legit. He was so hard that way, you know, which is dope. And then, um, but that rail looks way different with no snow around it and it's it's down the center so there's stairs on both sides you know so now i'm like i probably like chucked a couple back lips at it with the snow over and then he's like digging the thing out while i'm still practicing you know (laughs) and um somehow like turned over that back lip and was able to like make that work without getting broke off and it ended up being a dope shot and then on that same session I did it where I like board slid the rail and then came off and then filled a little booter up and like 50 50 over the bridge. So that was kind of like the, f- I think I want to say that's pretty much the first day. Oh, and I had my, my new pro model. So I'm on my new pro model, got all this stuff to prove, you know, and the first day really kind of testing my new direction. I want to go. I get like basically the opening shot and closing shot in my video part for decade. And Mac Dog was on board, and then, like, when he's coming back to the guys at Four Star and stuff and saying, like, these shots are dope, they had no choice but to really listen and get behind me, you know? And then, of course, like, Jeremy's totally on the same page, so it's like me and him have this vision of, like, we're going to just go ham on these handrails and just just take everybody out. Like, you guys aren't even thinking in this lane, and... We know what's possible. We just somehow knew that this stuff was possible. Even though thinking back about it now, like these old boards, how was it possible? Because they're not, they don't flex. They don't, they're not handrail friendly, you know. And that really just kind of set the direction for, I think, me and Jeremy to just take it a different way and not just do it like we're going to film another simple pleasure style part or like a stomping grounds type part, you know. Amazing. A couple, a couple other things, snowboard yeah. nerd stuff. I want to add on there yeah, too yeah. because uh, I believe the sequence of the nose press on Mueller mm-hmm. Park was the same year. It was the same year, but, yeah. So that was the first ever, and I could be wrong. I'm sure other people have nose press rails, but that was the first ever legit nose press that was like straight and yeah. not like it was used to be kind of a 45 like lean right. forward kind of right. deal, like kind of a gray area nose press. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was. Yeah, I don't know. Was that the first I, nose press I, on the handrail? I, I, as far as I know, it was. And I think the, the 45 stuff kind of came after because people couldn't, they couldn't figure that out. So mm-hmm. they would just kind of get on the side and like be on their nose, but not pressed, you know? And that was, so I'd seen Brian Thien, um, and he wrote for Special Blend. Big shout out, Brian Thien. Big inspiration of mine. So he was in um, Up in the Annie, which was like the Mac Dog video that came out after Hard Hungry and Homeless. And he, kind of rode onto like a flat bar and just no he knows presto but he just rode onto it and it was like at a resort so you kind of already seen this stuff before and people were doing it on picnic tables and stuff like that but on a on a square bar or even just a bar that was downstairs they had to like jump up onto like that wasn't happening and i just remember like that's got to be doable you know i was doing a lot of butters and stuff at the time and brian thien lived with rob mathis and Brian Thien was shooting for a decade too, obviously, because he's on the, the box cover. But um, I just remember, like, dude, I think I can do this trick. Called Mathis. I said, bring Chico. Like, I need his, like, energy around this. Like, and I want him to tell me if this is, if this plays or not. Because there's no video and you, the photo is filmed. So you can't, like, review it on the thing and see if you got it, you know? So um, 
went there, went to Mueller Park, set it all up, kind of played with it for a little bit and just dove on them as hard as I could. Like back then you had to like dive on them as hard as you could because the boards were not made for that. And one of them just, you know, when you do a, a proper nose press, it's like, got like this hollow feeling and it ha- and there's no sound. You don't hear your tail click on it. So that's kind of like, that's how you know if you can't see it that you did it. You, f- you felt that hollowness. You didn't hear the sound. And one, and that was the one. I just felt that and came off. And I was like, "Dude, I think I did it." And I'm like asking Brian, "I'm like, what do you think?" He's like, "Yeah, I think I think you did it. Like it, it happens so fast." He's like, "I think it's good." Mathis has this sequence of it, and um, he had to take a couple of days to get it developed. So I have no idea. He hits me up and he's like, "Come over here." I go, go over to his house. He's got it like in the little slide book or on the table with the loop. And I'm like looking at it. I'm like okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, and, like, get all the way to the end, and I'm off the end, and, like, the tail's up the whole time, like, cranked, you know, I'm like, damn, like, that's it, so I went there only with a photographer, and I did that a lot back in the day, like, would just, Mathis was, like, he was motivated that way, so he was kind of always, like, let's go shoot, and I was stoked to go shoot with him, but there's a lot of things I didn't film, I just shot photos of, and that happened to be one of them, so... I did go back and try to film it with Ross Steffi and I got broke off. I never actually got the film clip to go with it. So that sequence is the one and, and the clip wasn't in my part. So that's, that's That's what's crazy. How much it's changed that, that you would be out with just a photographer and no video for sure. That's unheard of now. Totally. Yeah. And the same thing at Mueller park, like, uh, I had a front side 270 in resistance. I think it was my second shot in my part. Stairs are all dug out and stuff. I went there with Mathis, same thing. He was like, I think you can 270 that rail. And um, this, there was still snow on it. And I like ch- chucked a couple up and did one with the snow over it. Like did it perfect, probably better than the one that's in my part. <laughs> and then he, uh, and then I land, come off, turn around. Before I'm even like out of my board, he's like shoveling the snow off the stairs because he wants that <laughs> sequence with the snow gone, you know? And then I'm like, all right. And then I did it again just for photo. And the sequence is in a Transworld interview I had. And it's better than the one that's in my video part. Like I did that one, bolts, no snow on the stairs. And then he actually shot the the video one because he already got his photo. So now he he filmed it for me. So it was like the film at that, or the video was like an afterthought, which is totally crazy to think of now. Like who would, you know, it wasn't an afterthought. It was just like, I went there with him and, he was kind of the motivator. He's a photographer. Probably was big doing, yeah, big photographer. I was probably doing that like dad thing, kind of like I want to like, I want this guy to like see me, and mm-hmm. I want to connect with him, and I don't want to get in trouble with him, you know. So, you got to get him the sequence. Got to get him the sequence, and then once I got all my chores done, I was able to like get him to, <laughs> to film me. You know what I mean? Amazing. <laughs> yeah. A couple other things in decade. Uh, yeah, decade. We got to talk about. Uh, Jumping over the whole half pipe clip. Word. That's fucking huge. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That was, um, that, so that was me and Mikey LeBlanc. We were just hiking those pipes up at Mount Hood. And early in the season, like back in the day, like they would, they'd build them kind of narrow because they knew they're going to melt out, you know? So that was a, a narrower pipe for sure. But it just so happened that like the way that it melted, it had like a natty lip up to it. Like we didn't build that at all. It was just, it was there. Oh, you just, it was formed from the side of the half pipe. Yeah. Oh, it shit. It melted out. That's I mean, we, we might have gone in there and kind of like tuned it up a little bit, but yeah. it wasn't like some built up thing. So we just like started like playing with that and like hiked up and just point, you know, those, those, those uh, veins up there are narrow, you know, you can't like come in from the side. You got to come down and hook it hard to, mm-hmm. to do it, you know? So that was the whole, that would have been the whole trick to it is getting that hook and keeping the speed to get over. But it did work, and that's that's the thing. That's just where I was at at that. I mean, kind of always with snowboards, like, how can I do this different? Like, I maybe could get a clip in this half pipe, but it's actually not that good of a half pipe, but I'm up here trying to film, so I want to get something. Like, let's jump over this whole damn thing, you know? So that was, that was fun, yeah. Shout out LeBlanc. He did that with me. He actually said, uh, I talked, he called me this morning before we recorded, and he had no idea you were coming in the booth to, to chat with us or anything. And he's like, oh, holy shit, like losing it. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> man, never seen anybody with as much laser focus as J.P. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that he 
has seen that in me because I think he's seen that in me from like a long time. And, and, uh, that is kind of that stuff we were talking about earlier, you know, where I, I was laser focused and I just had everything else like shut down, which was good at the time, but not so great later when when it all kind of falls apart you know because yeah. all that stuff's still there well he, he also mentioned he's like i lived with jp at a young age and like we'd all be partying and he just would like come home and be focused and yeah wake yeah. up and go snowboard before everybody or yeah i mean i i totally like um i've spent so much time up in my head like snowboarding kind of going back to the thing where i was saying like i don't think i have like the same natural talent that a lot of snowboarders do but i i kind of isolated myself in a way and spent so much time in my head like thinking about tricks and how to do them to the point of where when I'm actually doing it it's like I've I've really done this I've meditated and visualized essentially so deeply that it's not it's not like it's the first time I'm hitting the jump it's like I've already I've already been here I know this and I've had that um I've I've done that kind of deep visualization um so intensely before that when i've landed something it almost feels like deja vu because i'm like oh i've been here i know this like i was i've i know exactly what this is like because i was so focused into that moment before like maybe if i had like a specific clip i was trying to get and i so i had time to think about it or i knew we were going to go hit the certain jump and i had time to think about it and really spend the time with it you know you basically manifest manifest all so. your tricks. But, yeah, <laughs> but th- back then it wasn't referred to as manifesting or meditation. It was more of obsession. Or how did you view? It? I I think I always just called it like visualizing. Like people would ask me like, "How do you do it?" or "How is it, how are you doing it so well?" or something. And I would just be like, "I just visualize a lot," and I think I can do that. I don't know if this is something you do, but like I can visualize myself doing stuff from my own POV from other POVs, other different angles, all s- kind of simultaneously like this. I don't know. Like, simultaneously. Yeah. Like I can see it from all these different angles. Is that from practice? I think or it's, you were just always, I like think that. I'm just so obsessed with it. Like I would watch old videos and even though I loved what I was seeing, it was like, I was seeing how the guys could do it different or tweak it more or spin more. So it's like, I'm watching the video, but like, I'm like watching my own upgraded version of it. Wow. You know what I mean? (laughs) Something like that, dude. I don't even know. There's (laughs) even, even on some other deeper dive stuff too, but I think that might, you know, for me that there's a mechanism of escapism with my head where no matter what, like I just remember being a kid in school or, you know, things are going on home. You don't want to hear whatever's going on. You're, you can just go to that place in your head and just, think about snowboarding and just do it in your head. And that's, I've always had that as a kid too. It's like where, where, where you just, you can go there. You can be, doesn't matter where you are. You're in a totally different space. And I think it's a way to uh, disassociate with what's happening too. It can be used as like a, a a tool for um, escapism. Yeah. Escapism. I a hundred percent agree. That's exactly, I think what's going on. And it's just like, what's more, what's more compelling than, this thing that really has endless possibilities. Like you can never really run out of ways to distract yourself or to escape with this thing. So like I can just live here forever, Mm -hmm. you know? And we didn't have cell phones back then. Yeah. No distractions. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. That is amazing. Well, dude, I'm going to do a quick, I want to talk, I'm going to run through the whole resume real quick and then run it back because this is something that's really you know, we talk about our MJs on snowboards all the time, and, and everybody has different answers. Your name comes up quite a bit. Sometimes it's Terrier or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's – it's a, uh, there's a hand, handful of names you see quite a bit. But um, sometimes Sean White, whatever. But mm-hmm. I'm just going to read this list of video parts for the listeners and just to put things in perspective. You have Warriors, then Kingpin Chronicles, then you just moved over to Mac Dog. Simple Pleasures, Decade, Technical Difficulties, Resistance, True Life, Shakedown, Chulk Smack, That, Picture This, Double Decade, This Video Sucks, Cheers, Good Look, Gibberish, 2032, Videographs Visitors, and also throw in Nixon Jib Vest, Real Snow, and Spot videos like 
Uh, yeah. Who else has got the fucking <laughs> resume? Yeah, that's who else has the fucking yeah. tell me, tell me, come at me. <laughs> who has the fucking resume? There's nobody that has a more stacked video part resume than that in fucking snowboarding. Put a fucking exclamation mark on it. Word. And those are all <laughs> full, full parts. They're all and, and almost yeah. every one of them is either first, first or last. Or last huh? And that's going from the the fucking inception of a nose press to the fucking double cork to fucking one foot switch McTwist. It's like it's two decades. So anyway, we'll go back. I just had to say my piece because I'm Word. looking at my notes and I'm sorry, JP, but I had to get that off my chest a little bit because I, Word. yeah. Uh, Thanks for saying. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to. Um, Tech diff. Mm -hmm. This one's this one's. I'm gonna hijack the conversation a little bit because this video was the one that I got that I put in my VHS player. And how old were you? Your higher ah fuck. I don't know what year it was. I'm not good at math. We talking high school? When when that come out? Oh, ninety seven. Oh, ninety seven. So ninety nine maybe. I was probably like in middle school, like beginning of middle school or some shit. Wow, you're just a youngin. Youngin. So the the, the fuck, the, you'll never know. Your <laughs> fucking head. You're doing your thing, and you do the underflip, and like the parts ingrained. The parts in your ingrained, head. and and I actually remember in that video you had first part, and that that video made me that made me want to snowboard. That was like made, that video made me. You talk about hard, hungry, and the homeless. Mine was was tech diff, and and I actually even sidebar. Could not fathom why De- Devin Walsh had last part. I'm like, he doesn't hit any rails. I don't. <laughs> like, he's just jumping into soft snow. I don't get it. Back but then, <laughs> you couldn't have a real part be last part. Maybe. I don't yeah, know. yeah. It was kind of like a taboo. I think at that mm-hmm. point. Yeah. But let's let let's dive into tech diff. Yeah, word. So I I think the first thing that comes up for me around that is I remember um, I probably already shot for it quite a bit, but I was at Snow Summit and uh, there's that that flat bar that I do the switch nose press on. And I remember like Mac dog right before that basically came up to me. It was like, I know, I know what I'm going to call the next video. It's going to be called technical difficulties. And I was like, Oh shit. Like I got to do something really hard, (laughs) I guess really tech. I don't know. It just, it just hit me a certain way. And I like, cause I think I was maybe trying like nose presses on that. And then I was like, he's all, no, the next video is called technical difficulties. And I like, i like felt my stomach drop. I'm like, I gotta go to the bathroom and like, I gotta go take a shit. This is crazy. Like I just let that hit me so hard. And I was like in there, I'm like, no, I gotta do a switch nose press. Like, even though I, I don't think I'd ever done, done it really. Definitely not on something like that. Probably played with it on like picnic tables and stuff. And then I like went back up there like that same day. And like, I think, Kurt Heine might have followed Cam that, or maybe it was Mac Dog, but that was that one, and that all came from like Mac Dog calling this video technical difficulties, you know. So, and same thing that was shot on film, so I don't really know if I got it. I just kind of had to like go off my vibe on what it felt like, and he doesn't know either whoever shot it because they're paying attention to all their own shit, you know. But um, yeah, man, and that was kind of the same thing where I was like. I'm still going to go heavy in this handrail direction, had a really clear vision of how I could step up things. Like to me, the obvious thing was kind of like from back lips, where do you go? Like you go to front side two seventies, maybe you get into like switch front boards or obviously nose presses and stuff like that. And thinking about switch nose presses. So really was just in that same, that same vein. And then I was playing a lot with um, like those, those front side corks a lot because I learned those in the half pipe like basically hawk and flips you know and I wanted to like do that same thing off a jump and I think that's kind of why mine look a little bit different than other people's like some people kind of go back a little more but I kind of thought of it like a a half pipe while I was doing it off it kind of brought it under me at the last second you know so it's a front 180 McTwist style kind of. Yeah, it'd be like a front side 180 <coughs> to switch McTwist. Switch McTwist yeah. But on a jump, it's like a little bit less rotation because that would obviously be like a 720. Mm-hmm. So it's like a 540 version. So you kind of got to do a little bit something different at the end, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, and then I'm thinking about like uh, I had that front side 270 like over the kind of gap onto that bar and stuff. So that was probably like my first step into like a street 270 kind of feature, you know, it wasn't down like a handrail or anything. It was definitely like a, that was hard because the runway was straight and narrow. I couldn't like carve into that. I had to kind of like 
purely ollie it and get over the gap and try to square up the thing. So there, there's, I got a couple notables yeah. we got to talk yeah. about is yeah. uh, when we've talked about a lot, the park jump, uh, switch barrel roll to switch Manny. Yeah. What do you want to know? That clip's <laughs> fun. Dude, that, like that's just the most randomest <laughs> fucking trick ever. I'm going to do a straight up switch barrel roll and then land in a wheelie. And it's just, I don't know. I just, I, I always love that trick. Yeah, thanks for saying it. I mean, it is a random trick. I mean, that's kind of what happens when I think you take me to Mammoth and you're trying to get clips, and I'm just like, this is weird. Like, this is not my vibe. I'm, like, in the backcountry or, like, want to hit street stuff, but there's, like, a 60-foot or 50-foot gap here all of a mm-hmm. sudden, but I want to film. And I was playing with those those tricks also, that kind of, like, that switch barrel roll thing. There's one in the slam section, I think, of technical difficulties. I tried on kind of, like, this powder step down. I kind of tried to twist it a little bit, but didn't land it, so then... Yeah, I just did it on that, and then the manual part wasn't on purpose, but, like, I didn't want to fall. Like, I was so, like, I can't fall because that's just defeat, you know? (laughs) So I think I just – and the boards were, like, heavy camber, heavy, like, stiffness. So, like, you couldn't do that now, but I just, like, came around and saw that I was, like, kind of backseat and just, like, stood on my back foot and, like, got that press. And I didn't really think I had a clip out of that. There might even be one that I did that I landed perfect. But when the edit or the footage came back, that people were so like captivated by that that that's the one that went in, you know. So, well, at, as you're talking about footage, I got a great guest question from none other than Mac Dog himself. What up, JP? This is Dogger. What up, buddy? Anyways, just uh, yeah. First of all, congratulations on an amazing career in snowboarding that will never end in my opinion your influence and your uh, stewardship looking out for the sport is unparalleled but getting all along those same lines i just thought it would be a cool story if you could tell people about how you used to be basically quality control on the mac dog videos come in near the end of the edit and just start axing footage a total bloodbath until basically the video was tight I don't think people know that, and it would be cool to talk about. Take care, brother. Hope to see you soon. Word, yeah. Pretty, that's a pretty beast question to dive into, but shout out Mac Dog. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I learned that from him, actually. So I remember the first time I went to go look at my footage for Simple Pleasures, he had it all, like, queued up, and he started, like, ripping it apart. And I was like, this is insane. Like, you're, like, what do you mean you're going to take that shot out? Like, that's a good frontside five. And it was traumatizing, actually, to see that happen because I just didn't know that it went down like that. But I, after he edited my part like that, I actually stayed. So I flew out to Tahoe to edit my part, and then I stayed and kind of watched him edit the rest of the video. And I got a look into his process, which is like, it's not just your part. It's like the whole movie. And this is, you know, this is... VHS there's a certain amount of time you can really put on it it's like 30 to 40 minutes they're going to make these videos so it, it's not like I'm going to make each guy the best part it's like I got to make the the movie the best part so it's like your footage would get chopped down and then it would get kind of compared to everyone else's footage so it's like if you had a front side five that was looked pretty good in your part but somebody else had a a better one later it's like yours was suddenly up for de- debate you know what I mean that was kind of how at least I experienced it in the way that he chopped. And he was like deadly with the fucking cut tool back then. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, but I, I saw that that's why his videos were so tight. You know what I mean? I think that's why his videos were different than other people's because there wasn't filler, you know, it was like the guy's face, the guy's footage, end of story, you know? And for me that really hit because that's all I had space for back then. It's like, I don't, I don't really care uh, much about what these guys are into i just want to see them snowboard and i want to see them s- snowboard more so sure i want to see what they look like but i just give me the footage i need footage you know <laughs> <laughs> so i just you know now that i i'm coming from that i see how he's doing it i was like okay i got respect for that so i think what happened actually is Mike kind of got like a soft spot in his edits because when Miko, who wrote for Forum, like I don't know if you remember at the start of the video, kind of talks about how he hit his head and stuff. Like I think that kind of, Mike Mike was there and he filmed that and saw that go down. That kind of like 
fucked him up a little bit as far as like, you know, this is probably the first time I really saw Mac Doc have any like emotion or care about people's footage. And he's like, dude, I'm like, these guys are my friends and they're going out and they're like risking their life. And then I just come in here and chop all their shit, you know? And he was having like feelings about that. So I like as essentially kind of like booted him out of the chair and was like, I think I know how this needs to go because I learned it from you. <laughs> You're like, I will be the ax man. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, wow. In, yeah. In reality, you know, it's like he, him being so hard like that was actually the best thing he could have been doing. And it made him the best. Yeah. And it just so happened that like he wasn't, he couldn't really stomach that at that point, you know, because of what happened, you know? And so no, nothing wrong with that. Totally understandable. But, you know, luckily I was like at that time, um, I would, we would have been filming forum movies side by side and he would have been doing Mac dog productions movies. So those edits would have been happening in the same s studio so it's like we'd be editing forum like me and me and Kearns and Gary Pendergrass, and then uh, would, so would would do edits and then would go into Mike's edit suite and check his edits and it was pretty funny because he actually like we're editing True Life, he comes in to check our edit and he he actually did kind of drop the hammer on it pretty hard. He's like, you know, there's too much stuff here. I think it was speci specifically about my part. I was looking for feedback from him. And he like chopped it up a bit more and I was like, okay, like cool. And then, and then like, let's see what you got. And I think it was, would it have been stand and deliver maybe that they were editing? I go in to like watch his whole thing start to finish. And I was just like, dude, like how can you come in and like swing that ax on me? Like your shit needs to get chopped. It was like two hours long. Like get out, <laughs> get out the chair, son. <laughs> Something like that, you know, so in true life get out the chair. pretty much the most yeah. <laughs> iconic video ever made in snowboarding arguably. Yeah, word. So well, let's let's that that was awesome story. Was, um, let, let I mean now we're we're basically at uh, resistance true life era. Yeah, we could package. I think that is the height. Of okay. For I think that was that was like you were I word. mean, not that you weren't, but you were God amongst mortals <laughs> okay. like by a, like yeah, right yeah. Yeah. and and i have a question we can talk about these parts too yeah and i was thinking about this last night i just like this is a shitty question and i know mm. but i just want to ask like mm -hmm. what was it like being jp walker like during <gasps> true life like what was, you know what i mean like that's a i don't know how else to ask that yeah yeah i don't know man it was there was a lot of pressure for sure but also definitely had like a I guess like kind of like a rock star feeling where I was like I couldn't really go anywhere without someone noticing me not to where it became like some fan frenzy or anything but like it was kind of like anytime I went out the house like someone's gonna like shout me out you know so that was pretty crazy and then kind of like to what you were saying earlier about how like the line for me was like longer than than the other guys or for you guys when we're on a tour or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it was, it was, so it was like that. So now I'm here with like Peter and Devin and all these like big names and stuff. But like my line was like a lot longer and I was getting way more or a bigger response from kids and stuff. So that was pretty shocking because it was like, I'm still looking at Peter Lyon, like, and still do like, he's like one of the greatest ever, but it's like, people are checking for me. So it was like, it was, it was weird. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was weird. It was rad. And I think, um, somehow I didn't really let that kind of get in my head and take over. I think I was just so happy with the safety that that was kind of creating for me that I was like, well, don't fuck this up. You know what I mean? Like, don't like let this go to your head because you're going to end up like without any of this and then what kind of thing. So it was, it was challenging. It was, there was, it was demanding. Like people were definitely asking a lot from me and I guess like this might be a cheddar biscuits. Yeah. Uh, segue. Segue. Uh, yeah. Let's talk, let's CB talk yeah. moment right now. Huh? <laughs> Let's talk not, biscuits. Let's talk biscuits. Not to like swoop in on your guys' biscuit no, situation. No. I want to talk. We, we love to hear. About everybody biscuits. needs to. We know. don't talk about them enough either. Yeah. We're, We've been off them a little bit. Yeah, I guess like you were stacking. Yeah. Bisque. So what actually happened? So here, so what happened was I just finished filming Resistance and True Life, 
So two back-to-back forum hard pipe hitting next level videos I had ending part in both of them. I kind of had this feeling of like, this is going to be get, getting hard to keep topping this, you know, and they're talking about doing another movie again, maybe like in a, like a third one in a row. And I'm just coming off the back of like however many Mac dog movies, you know, and my contract's coming up. So I'm like, this is kind of, I could kind of see that this was kind of like a peak moment in a way. So I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta get what I deserve, I guess. And a lot of that came from people like Mikey LeBlanc and maybe Dave Downing and other people kind of sweating me about like, dude, you need to get paid. Like you're like on some next level shit, get money, you know? When you see Rawl driving around in a fancy car, a fancy yeah. house, yeah, and yeah. you're just like, hey, man. Yeah, I knew there was I knew there was money. I knew people were getting money, and I was like, okay, like definitely want to get money and like kind of feeling weird about it because like, I'm trying to keep this pure thing. It's all snowboarding, all this. Try not to contaminate my situation, I guess, you know, with something so um, sinister as money, you know. And, um, but I was like, and I, and I need to make a move. So I had a lot of, I think I really like, I think Mikey LeBlanc kind of had a lot to do with me getting up kind of the, the gusto to like step in and ask for it, as well as, as Sean Kearns, like, these guys kind of had my back, you know, shout those boys out. And then, um, somehow I like back then everything was hearsay. Like this guy's getting this much for this, this much for that. I start kind of doing this mental spreadsheet of like, Oh, I heard Daniel Frank gets like this much from Drake binding. Shout out Daniel Frank. And, uh, and this guy gets this much from these guys and this gets much from these guys. So I start kind of, putting that together like well that guy i'm kind of on that guy's level so i should i could probably get that too but this is all like hearsay money like i didn't know any of this for real you know and so i go in i'm gonna have this like a contract meeting basically i go down to san clemente i go to four star and i'm meeting with um this guy marcus bohe shout out marcus bohe and he's kind of one of he's one of the controllers or like kind of CFOs at the company or something. So I'm having the meeting with him. It's not with Rawl or anybody. And I go in there and I say, I can get this much for bindings. I can get this much for apparel. I can get this much for boots. I can get kind of broke it all out. And I gave him these numbers. And he goes up to this whiteboard and starts like writing the numbers down. And then puts like a bar across it and a plus sign and adds it up. And it's like 780 grand a year I'm asking for. Ooh. I didn't even I didn't even add it up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of like was like threw these numbers out there, you know. <laughs> and and as soon as he like writes that up and adds it up, I'm like, oh fuck. Like, like that's not what I'm asking for. Like, but like I just kind of had to <coughs> stay in the meeting, you know. You're like, and I did what I'm asking for, <laughs> but it is what I'm asking for. <laughs> yeah, and I like, and I like, um, and it's funny too because I like when I went to the meeting, I did a couple like sneaky things where I like, I think I was getting me and Jeremy were getting decks from Zoo York at the time, so we we're kind of like hooked up by Zoo York. So I think I wore like a Zoo York hoodie, and then I wore like uh, Wallabies, like Clark's. Like I wasn't wearing Circa or nothing. And then I, I, I wore all these different brands that weren't really like four star brands that were kind of my sponsors. Maybe I can't remember who else I would have been wearing, but to kind of be like, look, I'm not even repping you guys. You know what I mean? Just to kind of subconsciously. <laughs> like, games playing you know what I games mean? The yeah. CFO. yeah. Yeah. So it's like, and, and, and so, yeah. But when he, when Marcus wrote that down, I was like, fuck, like I just kind of like, this is a joke, you know? Yeah, did I overstep? Yeah, but I just stayed, I stayed tough in the meeting. I was just like, yeah, like, that's what I'm up for. And I was thinking, like, I was kind of thinking, like, a one- or two-year basis at that point. I was just like, I need, and I kept telling him, like, I want to strike while the iron's hot. I think I'm, like, hot right now. Kind of really hard to, like, say that stuff. I'm just this kid in this, like, office, you know? Maybe I'm, like, 23 or 4, you yeah, know? That's a child still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so I left the meeting. They're like, I think he he was like, okay, well, we'll think about it. Like, he didn't really balk at those numbers either, you know? At least he I didn't. think he had those same <laughs> meetings with Muska, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was all happening too, you know? So the, the, I know those guys were getting dough or at least asking for it, you know? And then, and that was the other thing too, is I, I kind of had this thing about 
you know, they, they were starting Genius or wanted to, and then they had the footwear brand. And so I was kind of like, yo, all this stuff wouldn't even be possible if it wasn't for like what we're doing here with these form movies and stuff. So like kind of felt a little like, yo, fall back and like take care of us, you know? And then, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then they, uh, I go home. I remember, I, and by now, it's just so funny because by now I actually had that same Mercedes that I was driving in resistance. Like, I, not the exact same one, but the same model. Like, I bought that. So, fully, like, life imitates art. I got, I bought it off Raw. Yeah, it was his old one, huh? It was his old one. I bought it and it was all, like, rimmed up and, like, had the full kit on it, you know? So, the thing was dope. And I was, like, sitting in it. I remember I was at Mitch Nelson's house here in, uh, kind of in Mill Creek. And Raw called me and he's like, hey, so we, uh, we, been thinking about like the the new contract and stuff and so what we want to do is just to kind of keep things simple is just do a five for five and i'm like okay what's that and he's like 500 for five years like 500 a year for, a five, year years. for five years so like 2.5 let's keep it simple keep it simple <laughs> i'm like not the 780 no i wasn't like that but <laughs> <laughs> wow kind of, kind of had my mind on 780 but five for five yeah 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 <laughs> and also that's so, that's that money stretches a little longer back then too word, that's, word. that's more like yeah. uh so that was like crazy so i was like yeah i'm stoked on that for sure you know like i never really i didn't expect him to come out with me with the five year with the term of five years i was just like i want like this kind of money for, like for a, a year. year or two you know and we can renegotiate. So I was like, for sure, like jumped on that. You went in there tough. Dude. I went in there tough, and then scared money don't make money. Exactly. And I guess now I'm thinking about it too. This is I can't believe I left this part out, but like around that same time. So between when I went and met with Marcus and gave him the number, and then and then got the call for the five for five, me and Jeremy flew out to Burlington because Burton was trying to lace us up. They're sweating. Yeah, and I actually had no interest in writing for Burton. I wanted to write for Forum. Like, I was just like, this is my squad. Mac Dog's all in there. Like, everybody's, it's in here, you know? And, uh, and Jeremy was still there at the time, too, you know? So, but we were friends with Downing, and he kind of facilitated that and was like, you guys just come out. So I was just like, sure, I'll come out and, like, listen to what they got to say. But no, no intention of doing that. And then we got there, and they had, like, contracts drawn up. Like, they were trying to get us to sign right there. I'm like, I'm still on. They had them drawn up. Drawn up. And they were, like, they were, like, for 300 jump off. So they had, like, big <laughs> deals, too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Something around that that price range, you Three know. Three for five or what? I don't know what their terms were, but I wasn't checking for I'm it. like liking <laughs> these terms we're getting out here. This is exciting. Yeah. yeah. Are, and, uh, <laughs> dude, what, 2000? 2000, 2001. 2001. 2000, 2001. That's, like, a million dollars now. You know, it's a lot. It's a know? lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. So we, so I think when we were out there, somebody, you know, maybe there was like a conspirer or someone that was working at Burton was going to be working at four star soon, but four star got word that we were out there, oh, you know? Shit. So I, and now cell phones are out. So like, I'm like, I think I got a call while I was like at lunch or maybe even in Burton from, I think Steve Ruff. Or maybe somebody else at Forum that were like, yo, what's going on? Like, kind of just trying to sniff around. Because somebody spotted us at Burton. And was like, There's that, make, that makes no building. sense. You know what I mean? So, and you know, those guys w were, I would think that they were stressing. Because we'd already went out to, to Burlington and put a, like, hurting on the whole town in their own backyard. Like, at Burlington High and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And they saw, like, what's going on. So, like, we need to swoop, you know. And I was like, so... That I think I mean Jeremy can tell his story about that, but that he obviously went that direction. But I, I had no real big interest in that. I was obviously stoked that they were were checking for me, you know. But I think, you know, them getting that rumor that I was out there definitely helped them come around to the the five oh, yeah. for five. Oh, so that was they hadn't offered you. The they five hadn't offered five. me the five yeah. for five yet. Oh, so well, that, well, but your commodity, your value goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, once someone, especially Burton, <laughs> sniffing. We, yeah, we got to rewind though too because we can't skip over resistance mm -hmm. and true life because those right. two, you know, obviously the resistance you uh, have the skit or you're mm -hmm. in the bends. Can and I you throw got the, two quick Patreon questions? Sure. Out? Yeah, throw them out because mm -hmm. uh, this is a good one. This is from Jake Oe, a new Patreon member. Pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. What started the Allen Iverson gear look? I was down. 
I mean, man, I was just all about like hip hop music and stuff like that. And it just, it seemed to fit really well with like the handrail type snowboarding and stuff. And I just, I just wanted to floss different kits and stuff. And it was like, it just, it, it didn't make sense even back then to be like kitted up on a street handrail. It was like, no, I, I, I want to really embody this street thing and and street riding. So like, I'm not going to be dressing like I'm in the mountains. I mean, dressing like I'm in the street. I want denim jeans and I want like a tank top and like no gloves kind of thing. So you don't want to look like you're an AK or something yeah. ready to go hell in when you're out yeah, in the streets. Exactly. So it just, it was just like, you know, a tangent off that really, you know, but, um, and then the, the rows were for the skit, you know, and then... Did you keep them for a bit after? I think I kept them for a bit after and maybe, like, re-upped them a couple times here and there, you it's know? It's a good look. It was a, it was a fun look, for sure, and then, yeah, headband goes good with that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to do one yeah. second Patreon question from Gregory Picard. What is the origin story of the Don? Yeah, I mean, that's a little vague, but I would say, like, that pretty much happened when we were filming for that so we were out in i think we were in stockholm or something like that and 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 if you can think about it now like forum is like of the og guys it's like me and peter and malmi i think for the most part because like devon eek and lowry had left and then there's all these new guys like travis kennedy and stevie bell and eddie kind eddie walls kind of new ika pat moore Pat Moore. So there was like this, it was kind of like there's these new dudes coming Young in. Young Bloods. Young Bloods coming in, up, you know. And I think I was probably just dropping so much knowledge on them. Like not even on purpose, but just like trying to kind of like direct it because I wanted to get clips, you know. And I just kind of, my OG crew kind of just got like cut in half when all those guys went to D.C., you know. So it was like, oh, they hadn't gone to D.C. yet because Lowry was still on. And Devin was still on. Sorry, I got that wrong. Those guys were all still there. But I was on the street crew with all the new guys. And so I think they just started calling me that on the trip. Because you were so knowledgeable. I was just dropping knowledge, I guess, you know, and they're just like, maybe uh, maybe Stevie or Kennedy probably said that. I can see one of them do that. It just stuck, you know, and then I'm on that trip. It was like a month-long trip in Stockholm, and they just kept saying and saying. But I'm sure you were teaching them so much. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd been to Scandinavia already before for handrails, pulling pulling torch and just making it happen. There's there's a lot that goes into that. So, If only people knew what went into it. Yeah. Well, to to run it back, because that's still, I mean, well, I'll keep it a little chronological right now. Okay. So, So you have... You know, we'll we'll lump resistance and true life together. Yeah. That to me, the the forum marketing machine at its highest, uh, strategic marketing ads, fucking font, board graphics, best videos. Uh, and the one thing I want to highlight about this too is like, you know, you, you talk about a lot of this stuff is like is is rail tricks. You know, we're talking about rail tricks, and and that that definitely skyrocketed you into the stratosphere but if you look at these parts you're doing like huge mctwist hawking flips uh but you know really i remember that gnc ad where you do like a front seven cr- cork or mm-hmm, whatever mm-hmm. crippler seven whatever you call it and it's like fish eye underneath i had that on my wall like mm-hmm. huge you're going 20 feet out of the half pipe <laughs> and so mm-hmm. and you have the back lips on the handrails and you have the 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 park jumps and the backcountry jump so I don't know. I guess I kind of wanted to like highlight the the fact that like that was when I feel like what you guys were like the biggest ATVs where you rode everything too. Yeah, definitely. I think that was kind of the thing is we had just me and Jeremy, especially from growing up around here, we had like the mountain skill, but then we had everything in the valley. So it was like we wanted to just get clips and a clip was it didn't matter what it was on. It was just a clips, a clip. And we want to, and we also want to showcase that we can do it in all these different situations, you know, and even, even like you say, half pipe, like there's no half pipe here, but we know at some point we're going to end up at Mount Hood. So it's like, I'm trying to stay brushed up on like trannies and stuff too, you know, or hitting like those big quarter pipes up at like Flagstaff and all that. Like it was all just like the more diverse and more, yeah, just more diverse your part can be. It's just going to hit harder because it's going to be unexpected, you know, because for, I guess, lack of a better word, like parts were kind of, there's good footage, but they're kind of vanilla. You knew what to expect. The guy's going to now hit another jump. Now maybe he'll hit a hip, you know, but he's basically just hitting jumps. And now it's like, 
one minute like I'm on like a whatever feature now I'm on this now I'm on that it just like kept people guessing I think and more more interested and that's what I I wanted to like really capture my audience and keep them engaged you know so that was part of my motivation for staying staying up on all the different categories amazing too one other thing too I want to talk about too with that is I feel like the approach is different then especially with form where you know I was talking to Dogger about this but he's like we wanted we wanted to be the best we wanted to be the best team. We wanted to make the best video. Like it needed to be the biggest. It needed to be the newest progression. It needed to be the best. And like I don't know if that exists. That, what do you th- like? I don't feel like maybe, it's maybe vans through like, a little bit of like that. In, a maybe years back. maybe in there like in Landline. rail specific or whatever. But there's not like the team even snowboard teams. I don't feel like there's like. There's not like a clear best snowboard team these days, you know. The game game yeah, done we're, changed. We're, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. I, th- I think I have an interesting story that kind of feeds into that about when we before we started to film Resistance. So we kind of came up, you know, Forum kind of came to us and said we want to make a team video. Like we've already seen like these couple last Mac Dog videos. You guys are the standout guys in it. We actually want to pull all you guys out of that, make our own video, kind of because we don't want like like all these other brands are getting like um, carried right in your coattails. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, I didn't really think like that, but I think that was kind of their thing. Basically like, let's stop people from even looking at the other people. Like they're, they're by default because of VHS, they got to see these other parts to see you guys. But if we just put all you guys in this thing, then it's all this package, you know? So they hire Sean Kearns to produce, resistance and so he he was already shooting he filmed pretty much most of Devin's part for technical difficulty so he was already working with mac dog kind of on almost like a day rate Devin kind of thing but he had all that um history shooting the whiskey films and that those had like a different look to them obviously and i think forum wanted to get somebody to produce it and kind of direct it other than dogger to kind of give it some kind of game or image or marketing because previously then like i was saying all the mac dog videos were like guy's name guy's footage you know so they wanted to differ differentiate the look with the the movie they wanted to make i gotta gotta take a breath there so so they present this idea to us and they're like we you know we're gonna get kerns he's he's gonna direct it and we want you guys to film a forum movie and it's just going to be you eight guys. And we're like, okay, well, that's not doable. Like, it just didn't make sense. Like, all these other films had, I don't know, 20 or 25 different guys shooting for them. And especially with that hardcore Mac Dog edit style, that only equaled, like, 35 minutes or something like that. So how are, how are we going to do this with just eight of us, you know? It totally became this different stress, really. A totally different, like, expectation that we're going to, no one's going to get broke off. Everyone's going to come through. No one's going to have a bad year. Like, that's kind of what it looked like. Everyone has to f- fucking hit to make this thing work, you know? So that was a lot of pressure, I think, because it went from just you kind of trying to focus on getting your own footage to, like, everyone's got to get it. And I, I've always been in there for other people to get their clips, for sure, but it was, like, different somehow. And so I remember we... we uh, the. F- the first meeting for that, um, we all flew up to Seattle and Kearns and Devin drove down from Vancouver to meet. And we had this team meeting about it where all this kind of got laid out. And uh, I'm sure me and Jeremy were just so bitter, like, this is lame, you know? <laughs> but um, they, the way Kearns laid it out was pretty harsh. He's like, he said a couple things that I remember. And one was... Um, I'm not looking for personal best. I'm looking for industry best. Like, I don't care what you've ever done. It's like what's ever been done is the new standard, and we're going from there. I'm like, all right, that's pretty hard, but I'm I'm Philia, you know. (laughs) And then, (laughs) and then he's like, and you won't be filming with any of your friends. So I lived with Mikey LeBlanc, and he was filming Mac Dog videos, but because he wasn't on forum, he was obviously going to be on a different project or maybe go film with Kingpin, you know. So it's like, you're not going to be riding with Mikey or Chico or Mitch. Like, and also those guys can't know what we're up to because we don't want people biting our shit, you know? So I'm like, all right, well, that's pretty hard, you know? 
And he's like, no girlfriends and no friends, basically. You know, like, this is it. This is your focus. We got to do this video. And I think because he was just as nervous as we were to, like, is this even doable? Like, he just got pulled in to make this unmakeable movie. And so, luckily, he he kind of was able to hold that energy and space and get everyone together to, like, focus in on it. Because that, that meeting was pretty intense, you know? So, um... Straight up said no girlfriends. Straight up, yeah. So that was, that was like, the tone of how it got laid out. Like, kind of like, this is, like, a do-or-die thing, all or nothing, you know? So that was our mindset going into it. Everyone got on board. I, th I mean, everyone pretty much came through, you know, the video was hard and like we had diff, you know, there's all those different ideas in it with the little skits and stuff to make it look different than the Mac dog video. Then it had all the branding and stuff like that. And for me, the, the intro to it, the three split screens, like mm -hmm. we obviously like bit that from plan B virtual reality, but like it just went so good. And like, that to me, that's one of the sickest intros to a movie that just gets 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 you hyped. So, yeah, that's a little little the movies worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the biggest. I think those are still to this day probably the biggest snowboard. Video. I mean, maybe just because of my age and they hit me, but I think those are like the biggest snowboard videos ever made. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know about how many units they were. Yeah, there's some units for sure. I mean, and if they were able to pay you guys that kind of money. They were yeah. obviously churning some boards. Yeah, you know, and they were churning some, some butter. They, they were, were churning butter. They over were there. churning some butter. Well, well, uh, also, something was happening. Yeah, there was definitely something happening. There was something happening to a point that um, I think it started during technical difficulties that MacDog was actually kicking back checks to people that had like heard that standout footage because he was checking so much money off the movies. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That was back when like Japan would sell a hundred thousand copies and for sure. Yeah. Distributors. Yeah. yeah. Moving unis. Unis yeah. were being pushed for well, sure. Well, at this point now we're at, we're at five for five. Yeah. yeah so, so yeah. Yeah. Woo. Now you just signed the five for five. Yeah. So I, well, I, th so then we filmed true life after yep. that. And then I signed the, the five for five after filming true life. Five, yep. And then, um, and that was kind of, we, that was essentially the same vibe. Like we're just going all in. I mean, I don't want to gloss over that movie, but we just kind of kept that same momentum of yeah. resistance and it was still Kearns producing it. We, now we know it's doable. So it's like, and then we had just, the vision was easier to understand, I guess. Jared Eberhardt, um, shout out Jared Eberhardt. He did all, you know, that's why it looks all black and white. Yeah, it has those tones to so it. Like awesome. he came up with all that and the like little, we call them art pods, the little things at the beginning with mm -hmm. the photos turning, like all the Mathis photos and stuff. So that we just, you know, is really lucky that we had literally I, all the components were lining up from not just from what like me and Jeremy and the rest of the team were doing, but like the guys behind the scenes, the shooters, Mac dog, the guys in, designing graphics and all that it was like this whole complete package you know so yeah so the so the thing that was crazy about the the five for five thing is another stipulation of the deal was <laughs> i don't want to film a part after like true life like i want to take a break and just go snowboard and like learn some new tricks and they they said yeah we're good with that and they actually said like um yeah, do a, do a two-year part and then do another two-year part and then I guess another year part or we'll figure that out then. They didn't even go out that far in like my timeline of what they wanted me to produce. So I, my expectations were like uh, two two-year parts with the five for five. So that's a pretty good deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, but that year, that's when the Nixon Jib Fest video came out. So, and I don't know if you saw, but on the box it said, like, um, there was, like, a sticker that said J.P. Walker's only footage for 2002, kind of like when CDs used to have, like, the nah. featuring the hit single or whatever. The only place to see J.P. Yeah, and the, and the Nixon video actually, like, checked, like, big numbers, like, really big numbers, like, maybe more than the main title, the main Mac Dog title that year, you know? So that was kind of a sidebar, but, um, yeah, and then started filming for... I had a couple clips stacked up for Shakedown, and then same thing. Kearns was going to produce Shakedown, but for, but now it was for Mac Dog. It wasn't for Forum because uh, Mac Dog and and Kearns and Forum kind of had like a bit of a falling out. But obviously Mac Dog was still producing videos, and so it kind of it separated out to like two films again. But not but it wasn't a Mac Dog film, and then. Um, 
Yeah, so now we're into Shakedown. So, so what was the forum <laughs> video aside, alongside Shakedown here? Was there one? There what? No, there wasn't. There wasn't one. There wasn't okay, one. That's it. what I'm saying. Because so, I don't remember. So you just did yeah, Shakedown. Just did Shakedown. You were the only forum guy in there, pretty much. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I, I can't believe I'm forgetting this part. So that's the thing is is that the the forum video was video games, but that that's wasn't what it was. video games. But that wasn't produced by Mac Dog or for uh, it was produ- it was produced by Forum. Yeah. Defective De- film. Defective, which was Sean Johnson's company, and Sean Johnson later started Stepchild. <laughs> Shout out Johnson. So um. That was intense because, so if you can imagine, I just like shook these guys down for like this big deal. And now I'm not going to film for your video games movie. Cause that, I didn't know this video games, I didn't know this separation between Mac Dog and um, Forum was coming, you know, cause Mac Dog is, he's an owner of Forum, but there's like this falling out kind of thing. So it's like he's just going to go do his thing, forget those guys. And Forum, I guess, just assumed that I would come along for video games. And they were scrambling to try to put production together for it because this is all happening in the summertime, like the negotiations falling apart and stuff like that. So I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like I'm, I'm MDP for, for life as far as I can tell. You know, this is what I, this is what got me into it. Like, yeah, those forum movies were sick, but that was under Mac Dog, and like that's my safe area, you know. Like I know that. That feels good. And now you're asking me to basically start over with someone and a whole new thing that you guys don't even know what it is yet just in the name of like keeping this like resistance true life train going i'm like dude that's not a good look i don't i'm not feeling that you know so i said i'm not doing it and they were fucking pissed because like dude they just signed me up for for bank you know and uh but that's how like much like heart and loyalty I had for Mac Dog. That was kind of where my loyalty was. It was with Forum too, but that was like my Mac Dog was the thing, dude. That was the 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 only thing that mattered. Being the Mac Dog video, you know. And uh, I think the team was probably pretty pissed because like I just stepped off to do Shakedown, you know. And then pretty funny, but there's so many funny stories around that. But um. And then, uh, but people didn't really know about it either. I think they just expected that I was going to be in the video games movie because, you know, there's not really the internet and people can't talk about it. It was just, and I think they were already marketing that I was going to be in it because they wanted to get this big jump on the video games marketing. But then, and I remember I went to like a premiere for it in Newport or maybe Laguna. The first, it was the first premiere for it. And I was sitting in there because I'm still like, these are my boys. I'm still all about form. I'm there to support. I'm just not in the video because <laughs> I didn't want to be. But um, the video ended and like d- uh, dudes were tripping. They were like, where's JP's part? And there was like even a guy behind me like, what the fuck? Like, where's your part? Like, he was like pissed at me, you know? Wow. Yeah, it was like kind of heated, you know? So I'm just like, well, you got to check for the Mac Dog video because that's actually w- who I film with, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And then obviously, like I had like the double cork was in that, and I had like a good part in that. And Jeremy, shakedown, shakedown, yeah. So, you know, it was kind of hard to not talk about shakedown that year. It was that the movie was good and it had the double cork and all that the stuff. It was fucking awesome. Yeah. So, so there was good footage in video games for sure, and those guys definitely filmed hard for it. But it definitely got like I think like got brushed under a bit because shakedown mac dog you know and it's funny because mathis was rob mathis he was really sweating me hard to like come over you know like you gotta come over he had all these reasons i'm just like dude i'm not feeling it and then probably like halfway through the year he like called me he's like you made the right choice like they weren't even they hadn't even wrapped shooting yet and he's like good you did it you did a good job you know i think that might have had to do with his just own personal uh grievances he was having and not so much with like the footage that was coming in or anything like that you know but um so that's yeah, that to to kind of like stand up and be like, no, I'm I'm sticking with Jeremy, Mac Dog, Sean. This is my crew, even though you just paid me. That was like that was really hard for me, and I had like a lot of anxiety about that because like with that huge check, I put huge expectations on myself, and now I'm like in this weird space. It was not comfortable, you know. I had no choice but to put out footage, and then I like broke my jaw, and it was like all this shit. So it was just like. It was it was hard, dude. How do they break up a five hundred thousand dollar check for you? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because we th- go on lump sum, we go on monthly. This I is mean- th- th- this is super funny, and I'm glad glad you asked that because um, 
Let me see if I can. I got to check in with myself and see if I can say this. I'm going to try to say this, I guess, and we'll see. But the one thing that um, the guys at Four Star did when they set up that deal, it was five for five, but they kind of structured it in a way that um, I actually wasn't getting it like evenly chopped every month. It was like a significant amount every month. Like I can't remember, but it was like like tens of thousands of dollars every month. <laughs> and then they had it set up so at the very end of the contract, there was all the all the money that hadn't got paid went into this kind of balloon payment that they called it. And that number ended up being like 300 grand was like kind of got shelved off into this balloon fund. Wow. And so if you fast forward a little bit, like we did shakedown and then now we're, we're filming for that. And that, and that is now under Burton control or forms under Burton control. Cause they bought it at this point, you know, but they didn't know about the 300. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> did they buy your contract? Well, they tried to shake me down they and, and shake down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I get it. Like they bought a new company and like, no, I don't have any like, hard feelings or anything about that but they they did try to talk about renegotiating my deal because i still had years on it and it's five for five so it's like sure they want to get the best deal and i'm just like no and my contract was bolts because i got my boy paul wood shout him out my lawyer and um so i was i was bolts they, they bought your contract they had to it was just Came part it was just part of the deal you know but wow but then I'm kind of jumping forward, but so I film I filmed the video part for that. I thought the part was hard, like I was stoked on it. And then my deal's up, you know. And then so that's starting to get renegotiated. And that, we can talk more about how that fell apart or whatever, but that's when I left forum is after filming that. But I didn't get a I I got to leave with the balloon payment that they didn't know about. So I was like, Yeah, I'm not gonna sign, I'm not gonna stick around, I'm gonna do something else. They had first right of refusal. So I had to, it, I, I chose to be a free agent for like six months or something. Otherwise, if I went and got another deal, they could just match it and I'd have to, I'd to, have to ride, for, I'd them. Have to ride for them. So I just like got on ice for a while and it was just like, but I was okay to get on ice because they owed me that 300 Ooh. that they didn't know about. So when they found out about that, they weren't that stoked because <laughs> they were, they were, <laughs> They were probably trying to come at me in the new negotiation, like, you know, he might be desperate or whatever. He's like... Not when you throw a check not, for not, But not when I know I'm, I've got this, like, kind of... Let's go buy a house money. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys oh, think about unreal. that? Unreal. Yeah, Dude, that's I can only imagine awesome. their jaws dropping when they found they out not, about the, yeah, the balloon pissed. payment. Just like, huh? Shout out to your money? lawyer yeah. on that one. Holy yeah, shit. shout him out. Yeah. But how would they know? You know, this is like, this happened five years ago. It happened under Four Star. Yeah. That's just the way they structured it. That stuff's going through accounting. Like, the guys in marketing and boards aren't seeing that. Yeah. You know, they don't know how it's getting, like, fed out. I just know that I'm good regardless what happens because I got this balloon payment. As long as the like brand's alive. Racking up. Yeah, exactly, yeah. you know. So Shout out to the balloon payment. Yeah. Word. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Dude, well, you, we, were, we were cruising, uh, and I got to get back in my uh, snowboard nerd shit for okay, a second okay. for Shakedown because yeah. Shakedown, uh, front board the kink at the beginning, Troy kink, that was amazing. We're on the east. We used to always try to go to that. But, uh, you know, first little uh, cult, cult classic uh, back three method love mm, that clip mm, thank you and then um obviously we got to talk about the uh the double cork yeah i mean what do you want to know i mean <laughs> I, I mean shot film i heard the story that yeah. it, it didn't it didn't um you didn't andy didn't know if he actually got the sequence right, right. the film might have burned out yeah it was it was stressful it was kind of like um so to, to start like that was actually the first day that i went out filming after i broke my jaw so I just was out for like five weeks, probably waiting for my face to heal up. And now it's like, I don't know, maybe end of March or, or early April. And it's like, I'm stressing like lack of pow days coming up. And I'm in Utah. There's snow here. We go up to Tony Grove is where that was at up in Logan. And Anthony Vitelli, who shot for Mac Dog like up in uh, Canada, he drove down with Chris Brown to come get this storm that was coming through here. So those guys are in town. We had a pretty big squad and we went up there and I was just kind of like feeling like I got to make up for this lost time. Like I had a pretty good part going and then I got broke off and 
I got this $500,000 deal I got to live up to, plus all the demons going. I'm like, I got to do something marvelous, you know? So I already kind of did, or I rotated a double cork on accident on a third wind lip jump behind Brighton. I was trying to do like a front cork, like how I do them, and then add on a 360 to do like a front cork nine. And I just gave it a little bit too much gusto and flipped it over kind of twice, like did it, but landed on my back. And I was like, okay, like, I just did that thing where I got in my head and like did the visualization, you know, I didn't have any video of this attempt, but I, as somehow it made sense that I could actually bring that to my feet, you know? So that had happened a couple of years ago. I had like that kind of queued up in the like uh, data center or whatever. All this stuff happens. I'm out there. We build that jump. It's a good jump for it. Start trying it and did it third try. So and I think that just speaks to like the visualization thing, you know, cause it's like, I haven't even seen this rote. I don't even really, I know what it f- kind of feels like from my POV, but this is something I actually can't really see from like an external POV somehow, you know? And I just remember like, uh, when I landed that, I just, it's, you know, you know, the jump, it rides out onto that lake. Yep. And I just remember like, it was like from the moment I landed, it was like I landed and I felt like the the world was different all of a sudden. I was like riding out under this lake, like this is a different world now. And I just felt it change, like in my whole body, like in the stomp. It was fucking crazy, dude. And then I ride, ride across, come to a stop, kick out of my board. Jeremy, everybody else is up there, all giving me like cheering all stoked you know i look over and i see vitelli and and andy um kind of posted up from their their filming perch and they're silent they're not saying shit so i'm just like that's not a good sign you know (laughs) so i like i go over there and uh probably i don't know i might got picked up in the sled and went over there and started talking to them and they they didn't really say anything but they were stressing because um we were hitting that jump in such rapid succession that Anthony was kind of having a hard time, like keeping track of who was dropping and what was going on. And he's shooting movie film 16. So it's like a bit of a process. Got to stop and change film. He's panicking. It's like a big crew. He just drove down from Canada and you can see in the footage, um, there's like a light leak that comes in and that's him when I'm like mid second cork or about to go, go around in a second time he starts to pull his eye off the viewfinder thing and that on a 16 will actually let light in and can expose the film incorrectly so that's what that little light flicker is him going like oh fuck he's gonna because he hasn't seen this before it just makes no sense the dude's flailing you know what i mean but then he like luckily like got his eye back on there but he knew he did that he can't watch the footage so Mm. he's sitting up there going like did i fuck that up you know and I had to wait like three months or not three months, but a couple months for that footage to come in. And I was just like, dude, like we all knew it happened. So it was just like this huge panic to know if it was going to be there or not. And then same thing with Andy, like those film cameras, like Stone, you know, when you get to the last frame, it it auto rewinds. Mm-hmm. So he's he's shooting a sequence, thank God. And it gets to the last frame that's that he can expose and it starts rewinding but he doesn't know how deep in the yeah, did he get enough landing did he frames? get enough he's like did i get any or did i just get one or yeah. is it, i'm right above the ground like it was unknown you know there was no hey will you go back up and try that again fuck no Not going down. <laughs> i never did that in my life <laughs> so they was, didn't try to get you to do that no i think they were so like probably traumatized, traumatized they missed it yeah. that they kind of didn't even really tell me and they just, they were, just were, quiet. they were just sitting in their pain about it. You knew it. something was up. Yeah, but I knew something was up because they were just kind of quiet and stuff. But Sitting in their pain. Yeah, and then it's it's kind of funny because I'm thinking about like how like desperate and hungry I was at the time. Like I went up after doing that and did a, a cab nine mute. So it was like, I was like, just, I got to get clips, get you know? Clips. Like even, like you would think you do double cork, you're chilling. You oh know? yeah, I was like, first no, double cork. I got to go get this switch front nine real quick too because the jump's kind of calling for it and I need footage. So it was like, unreal. Wow. Pretty heavy. Unreal. Yeah. All right, you know what time of the show it is, Buzz? Ooh, name that video part. Oh no. Name that video part. 
So, uh, how you feeling, JP? This is a big deal. I'm nervous again. Are you nervous? Kind of. Yeah. But I'm going to practice some self-compassion. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. Okay, I think you'll probably get this one. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> Duffacy. That was too easy, huh? Yeah. Duffacy, what video? True life. That's it. You got it right, just, JP. Yeah, he's just uh, waiting for everybody to catch up or... Oh, word. You get yourself, you earned a bomb hole prize pack. What's in there? Bud's packed that All up for you. All sorts of know. good stuff. We got a staple hoodie. We got a black corduroy oh, cap word. right there. I like there. that one. We got a uh, Yeti mug in there. We got some stickers. All that stuff's available at bombhole.com. We got the new Mud Dog tee. Word. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Oh, I the shorts. Oh, look new hey, shorts. New shorts. shorts. B-ball shorts. Go pump some iron with you boys over there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Much appreciated. Word. Thanks for coming on the show, JP. Yeah. Yeah. You might actually know the part two as well. This one's for okay. the listeners. Okay. Um, you know what we should do for this name that video part? We also have some other stuff to give away too. Um, we have a full 32 kit, I believe, a full JP signature kit. I think we do. And maybe a full Grenier kit too. Full Gren yeah. Wow. Maybe yeah. we'll give the first two people. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everybody's going to, I don't know, I think some people know this. And... Do you have a board or no? We can do something. I do different. have a board. I have my Santa Cruz Pro Model 154 that's in stores now. And I brought that to give away. I took a couple laps on it too. But it's basically crispy brand new. We could. I have another idea how to give that away at the end maybe. We okay. So we'll just save these two. Our, our 32 kits. Um, we'll give away to the, uh, the winner. The first two people? First two people that comment on Instagram. So how it works is if you know what video part song this is, comment on Instagram on Bombhole's Instagram, on JP's, it's like a photo of JP's face. It's what we call the thumbnail photo. And that's where you say whatever video part you think this is. And then we can see who commented first, and we'll pick a winner. Okay, um, here we go. And I, if you know this one, JP, say it after, and we'll beep it out. Okay. I don't want to be with anybody at all. I know that one, but I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself by saying something okay. so far off base, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Well, thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. <laughs> All right. We're going to get into a guest question from Mountain Dew Team Rider, Red Gerard. What snowboard video part would you describe as the all-time best? That's easy. Jeremy Jones and Shakedown. Woo! <laughs> that is a respectable answer. Jeremy is answer. gonna love to hear that, huh? Damn, that's a good answer. Really good answer. That's a good answer. Okay, I'm gonna stay on the guest question train. I got one from Scotty Stevens. Here we go. Hey guys, I got a follow up question. Uh, that one being, JP, what's your favorite trick you've invented on a snowboard? Um, you know, I've watched countless videos where you did a brand new trick year after year after year for like two decades and i'm just um curious what the most meaningful one to you is so thanks dudes thanks for the question scott <laughs> um i don't know that's kind of a hard one i mean i'm gonna say right now i'm gonna say my favorite trick that i invented i mean we just talked about double cork and stuff so that's kind of kind of muddies this up a little bit but i'm thinking right now what's kind of i'm holding close is um front board pretzel because i actually can't do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> so it's like is that like an age your I back think, i people think people say so. it hurts your back later it's, it's not that it hurts it's just that there's an amount of effort required to do it properly the at least the way that i like to do it that it's like i don't really know if i want to spend my energy on that when I read, you know, it's kind of, it's asking a lot, you know, so I'd got to go with that right now. Solid. And that was a true life intro. That was, came out in shakedown. Shakedown. Oh, well I did it. I did it in true in life on the cur curb rail. rail. Yeah. So I did it there, but I, I kind of consider the street rail that I did it on as the real official one because mm -hmm. it's street certified. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Did Streets. you name it as well? I think that. The pretzel moniker was already kind of attached to that type of movement from skateboarding. Nah. So I think, you know, it'd be a front board front side 270 out, I guess would be the right, tech. The, the tech yeah. call for it. But that was on a rail down in 
Provo, I think at BYU Stadium. Mm-hmm. The rail actually didn't drop off very high, which makes it hard, but the rail wasn't very steep either, so it kind of kind of worked, you know? Mm-hmm. Wow. And there's also one thing we breezed over too where you, I think in true life, is that where you made a uh, conscious decision where you're like, I'm going to film street, like yeah. just street clips, not yeah. park clips. Yeah, that was kind of like the intention that I tried to like get across in the opening kind of art pod slash voiceover piece. Like I'm hitting those rails. They were actually part of the Jib Fest. They were at Snow Summit, and I kind of had a couple clips on them. And it was it was like this is the last time you're gonna really see me in this environment um, because I'm moving into this like street category, and this is the new. Um, this is only going to be acceptable in this environment from here on out and then i guess i had a uh, switch 450 later on the park in my part but that kind of that's kind of a gray area <laughs> <laughs> well let's keep let's keep Can i hit one more page yeah hit a page yeah so this is from uh travis kerr gotta ask about the all switch stepchild part was that something you wanted for a long time were you trying to prove something to yourself or just mix it up yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think it wasn't something I'd wanted for a long time, but I'd kind of seen a trend in my own snowboarding, like the years leading up that I did have a pretty big bag for switch moves. And then at that point, I don't know how many video parts deep I am, but I'm like, I, I want to do something to spice it up and motivate myself. And so I had been thinking about it maybe just a year or two before doing it. And um yeah, just really, really, it was almost more, not so much to prove anything, although that was probably had a part in it, but more just like, I need to get myself motivated somehow, because I don't really know how to do a part right now, the same way I've been doing it. So why not just, it was like the, it was kind of like the first concept part in a way, like this is like the frame I'm going to try to stay in. So that got me excited and that's really where it came from. It's a big commitment to like I, word. I heard there was rumors spot. where you were like brushing your hand teeth with your left hand. You were doing everything like yeah. that. Really? Yeah, just in like the summer. Like I kind of decided at the end of the year before that I was going to do it. So I had like kind of all summer and I was like brushing teeth the other way and eating with sushi with chopsticks, other hand, and just trying to get myself uncomfortable so that it wasn't such a jarring event when it happened. And then my intention going in was... I'm going to go up to the spot. I'm going to strap in switch from day one, and I'm just going to try to stay in this goofy-footed stance as long as I can. But I'm going to, you know, if I need to deviate from that to maybe, like, test something or if there's something I want to get a clip on and I can't just can't come up with the switch version of it, I'm not going to stop myself. And that's why there's those two other clips in that video, like, separate from my part, like that nollie over the fence. and then Nollie 360? yeah. We should talk about that. We keep going, though. Yeah, and then just the front board on, like, kind of that step-up rail. So I didn't, like, you know, I, I kind of was like, if at the end of the year I got enough footage for the all-switch part, then I got it. And luckily I just was able to to hang in there and, and do it. I yeah. would say, I was talking to Stevens doing my research, in it, and the, the switch part's amazing, obviously. Don't want to discredit that. Thank you. Switch. I love the switch uh, Wildcat over the gap. That Word. was a cool one, but right. uh, uh, I think the most one of the more underrated things of your career is the Nolly three hundred and sixty over the bar. Um, yeah, that just it was just dope. It was like yeah. it was like a skater doing a trick over a jersey barrier. It just like took pop. It had a cool drop. It was sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for saying because I I was really stoked on that clip too, and it did kind of sneak under because it wasn't in my section. It was kind of this other thing. I was afraid to put it in my part because then maybe it would somehow cancel it from being an all switch part. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh, but it's Nolly, so is it kind of... I just, like, keep it separate. I don't want any uh, questions asked. But at that spot, it's a lone peak over mm-hmm. kind of by Jeremy's house, and a lot of people hit that kind of closeout rails there. And I w- went over there thinking I wanted to try that. And because I was doing that over, like, slow signs and stuff a bunch, I liked that trick. And um, there's a bench over there next to, like, the... Um, playground area and I like walked over to the bench and like leaned against it and it was like however high like hip high like I kind of marked it and then I walked over to the the bar and I walked over and the bar was like this much lower and I was like okay and then I so I came down and I did a couple nollie cabs over the the bench so I was like okay if I can get over that I can get over the bar but then it has the the big drop too right so it was kind of a mind fuck to go into that thing and like fully commit like nollie and 
got over it. Yeah, no lip, just like no lip. And I really wanted to like showcase that, like that it was it was dead flat. Mm -hmm. It was flat, you know. So probably couldn't do that one again at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're cruising along, and we gotta we gotta. I mean, Jesus, there's so many parts, but we I think there's some other stuff I want to keep talking about here. So you, you know, we talked we talked about that another ender, Mm -hmm. obviously giant larger than life video the forum video mm-hmm. i believe after that was choke smack choke smack came out after shakedown before oh was it before, before that? That. so i had those backwards yes. yeah yeah so was there something did your did your dad pass away around that time? he he passed after that he passed in 2007 <coughs> okay. so i just filmed that was kind of like a challenging time because he had just like i filmed that and then there was kind of all that uh stuff with me getting ready to leave forum and then I already knew my dad was sick. He had pancreatic cancer. So he already went through some surgeries and done some chemo and stuff like that and kind of bought himself some time, I guess. And then, and then, but he started going down again. And by then, um, yeah, I was, I was moving away from forum and then, um, that was around the same time that double decade was going to come out. So I was literally kind of like, going and luckily we shot a lot of that around here because my dad was in hospice at the time so i was like going and like filming and then like going and hanging out with him and like trying to get care for him and stuff so that was like just beast because i wanted to be in this double decade film obviously that was like a big milestone and stuff and didn't really know it was going to be like mac dog's last film at that point but i was like i'm in the first one i want to be in the second one so i like yeah, I remember like hitting that like uh, chain link fence thing over there, and then like immediately getting that clip and then just taking off to like go like try to be with my dad and stuff like that. So between him passing and trying to film the part and then separating from form because now I'm on I'm on stepchild, so it's my first year on stepchild. I want to like make a big impact there. It was like is a lot of stuff, and I'm I'm like probably about 30 years old at that point which is like minor i think but back then like everyone's so afraid of like even like a late 20 year old snowboarder so yeah it was it was tough were you and your dad tight in the end yeah i mean he i kind of just had um peace around like all the stuff that happened when we were young maybe not peace but i just was like understanding and compassion of it you know yeah like an acceptance kind of thing and he was like in pretty rough shape because he never really stopped drinking. So it was like, I could only really get so close to him, you know? So it wasn't like, um, yeah, when he passed, I was really sad and I, I miss him and stuff, but it wasn't like, um, yeah, I, there's like no bitterness or anything yeah, like that about good. why were you? I wonder if why you never drank much was because he drank. For sure. I yeah. think, yeah, I think that was definitely part of it because I just, I was afraid of that. I was afraid of him when he was drunk because he just, I never knew what to expect. It was like a, just a chaotic situation. So that just was scary to me and I didn't want anything to do with that. Yeah. yeah speaking, speaking that we've been all over the world and uh, done at least a few international trips and I've seen, never really seen you tuned up. Yeah, but have I like do, a beer too, right? I do have a story that is fucking incredible I okay. need to tell in okay. regards to this, and I, I think you know where this is going. All right. But when we were in New Zealand one time, uh, it's summer there when it's, it's, or it's winter there when it's summer here, so I was boozing, man. We were fucking getting, we were getting lit up. Like, I was just getting pie-eyed. Everybody was just hammering pie-eyed. beers. Pie-eyed. Aside from JP was keeping her, keeping her dialed in, but I was kind of like, you know, little kid full of vinegar and i was like jp play me in pool jp play play me in pool come on play me in pool and he's like no dude i'm too competitive like i'm not gonna play you i'm not gonna (laughs) i'm not gonna play you i'm like come on fucking play me whatever i'm just being a punk and then jp proceeds to break and and you want me to fill this in yeah fill me (laughs) And then I proceeded to clear the table, and Chris didn't even get to take one shot. Really? <laughs> really? I I've told never him not seen to play me. Happened in my life. I don't know if that's like that's not a common thing because I've never seen that in my life. Yeah, kids I mean, nice with the pool stick. Kids huh? nice with the pool stick, and I didn't want to like hurt anybody's feelings. I'm such a like caretaker, you know. I, want, I wanted you to have your shine. You seem like you're having pretty fun on that trip. That was like a 32 trip. <laughs> that was yeah. a 32 trip. Let you yeah. have your shine. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, to. I'll tell you that just took you and put you in like legendary status. 
Yes. <laughs> I played JP once in pool. He cleared the table and he closed never the door. Shot. Never shot. I didn't yeah. shoot once. Yeah. It's fucking that's, crazy. That's perfect. Oh, I got a kind of I got a surprise kind of sidebar real quick actually that I I want to do if that's all right. Yeah, let's do it. So, and this kind of fits in that since we're talking about that 32 trip, but the kid got his new boot. Ooh, he's gonna floss. That's Liking the new, the new, colors, the, the new JP Walker. That thing is baller. But I also got the new Grenier. Wait, Whoa. what? Is, this my, is that my new boot? <laughs> this is your new boot. Wait, what? <laughs> that I got. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see uh, that thing. <laughs> what? Never Damn, you seen that I yet? seen this in Photoshop, like in a in a PDF. Damn. Damn, this one's hitting. That's like a. Uh, Damn. You know, they got to send that to me first to make sure it's official. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to either yay or nay that thing, huh? Oh, fuck yeah. Dude, this thing looks good, man. I'm hyped on this. Let's cheers. Look at cheers. you guys with your right. boots. Yeah. Let's <laughs> put that right on the table right there. Yeah, let me uh, get a space for this real quick. But uh, Those are both very yeah, nice team three. looking boots. Is yours a team two? What is that? Mine's the uh, JP Light. Oh, it's the JP Light. He's got his own name. I got my own that. name for yeah. mine. But Liking um, those red hits on Yeah, that's a good looking boot, JP. Yeah. What's the inspo on that? Just kind of like, you know, military like grade with the pop color. Just yeah. to kind of, you know, not do anything super crazy, but I don't know. Nice I see and, a lot of nice military with orange. I'm liking the military with red. Yeah, just try something different. But um I don't mean to sidetrack the convo, but no, I thought I thought you might like to see that. No, you this know is what amazing. I mean? this yeah, is that's amazing. a pretty sick surprise. I mean, honestly, like, in th we wanted to, I wanted to mellow it out this year and just do something that's like kind of like a, a that, mellow. That thing looks like it's prepared to push some numbers right there. Yeah, or, yeah. wanted to, you know, some some That'll years hit. you go crazy with colors, some years you dial it in. But I do want to say, like, that's one thing that's really cool about Thirty Two is they give us the opportunity to design a boot and take a lot of rider input, and we get to design outerwear yeah. and. Yeah. Uh, Fucking go on trips and he gets to clear the pool table. <laughs> <laughs> fucking didn't get to go. Yeah, dude. So rider driven snowboard. Wow. Yep. And it's owned Word. by owned by a skateboarder snowboarder, Peter. Yeah. So Word. awesome. I want to dive back into Bisque talk because Word. I heard there was a rumor that at one point you had unlimited <laughs> travel budget. Yeah, the the rumors are true. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a smart move, though. Keep the kid in the streets. Bottomless bus. It's it. it. yeah. gonna yeah. get shots. That's it called burning budge. Yeah, it was basically like if you're out filming, like we'll pay for it. So that was under forum when it was four star distribution. They were just like, we're all about like enabling you guys to get footage and get more of it. And like, I think they were even like, if you guys want to go get like personal trainers and go to the gym, like we'll pay for that too. Like. They were just all about like empowering us to to get footage, you know. So that that was really cool. And then, I mean, it the that didn't last forever. It got chopped down. I think it's like stepped down to like forty jump off at one point, which it's is still, still forty is like, not a bad budge. Not a bad budge. Yeah, you, you can know? burn some budge with that. Yeah. You can pretty much go anywhere all season. Yeah, with but 40. those yeah those European. What's handers, the most you ever spent? It was probably like in the forty range for the most part. I think that's probably where that came from. Yeah. You know. But um, were you, know, you like living in your own room, and then the young bloods were all stacked together nah, in their room? No, nah, I was holding <laughs> it down with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I didn't go, I didn't like take advantage. Some, some dudes like, yeah, like the they went in on like the mini bars and all the other stuff, you know. But I like, I, for me, it's hard to ring up a big tab because I'm not getting drinks. You yeah, know what I mean, but I might like be the guy that's gonna go get the rental car, or buy the torch, or like spend a bunch of cash on like production equipment basically to make it happen you know so and you're the type of guy to post up in a foreign I'll city for up. a month uh, easy. easy yeah easy. The, you guys are the early scando uh you know you guys paved the way in the scandinavian for street sure. trips for sure yeah now yeah, shout out helsinki yeah. shout out to helsinki yeah. now i want to talk talk about something uh that is fascinating to me and you've mentioned this to me before about how you basically said that you're one time i don't know where the fuck you were but you're like my favorite time in life was the time between when you've just filmed the good video part mm -hmm. and you're done filming and then the the fucking video part like comes out so right. that like that buffer period like <coughs> it was was the best for you or something like that i want you to elaborate yeah. on that yeah i mean that that's pretty much it it's like for me that was when i kind of felt the most secure i guess like cuz even though I'm out filming and really kind of distracting myself from the demons, it's it's still stressful and it's still a lot of expectations and stuff. But it's like once there's, 
I mean, there's always kind of snow, but once there's really no more snow to film on, it's like, I don't, I can, I can let myself off. So I'm like, okay, well, I actually kind of can't go film anymore. So like, it's okay to fall back. And if during that time I have like a stack of footage and especially if I know it's like hitting like bangers and stuff, I just feel so good. It's like, I have my footage it's done. There's not really expectations of me. I can't do anything. And then it's right up until basically like the movie drops. And it's almost like when the movie comes out, it's like I now have zero shots again. And I think like, a, you know, I know like guys like Seth Hewitt and probably Joe Sexton and, and Jeremy like kind of feel this same energy. I don't know how you are with it, but it's like, yeah, now it's gone. It's out there. I want people to see it, but now I'm actually like left empty. You know what I mean? And now I just have to do that all again and go find my security again. So it's it's a comfortable place. I really just loved to do that. And that was a big motivation for filming. Like if I like I can enjoy a couple months of summer like guilt free or something if I have this footage to hold me down, you know? It seems so. like you did that for I mean if you look at the resume, it probably had a lot of a lot yeah. of summers like a that. A lot of enjoyable sure. summers. Sure. And sure. and I'm gonna just squeak right back into snowboard nerd mm-hmm. stuff too again mm-hmm. because it's just important to talk about. You talked about you know double decade, um, and there's there's a specific trick in there that's like you think about decade, ten years later, double decade, decade. You guys are just figuring out fucking how to go down a handrail, you know. Mm-hmm. And then d- here you are, ten years later, double decade, back ten tail grab form step down. Yeah, dead flat. Dead flat, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, thanks for mentioning that. That's definitely one of my favorite clips I ever got. And, um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I did a back 720 on that in true life, but that's, like, you know, that's 10 years earlier or whatever. So I had I had an idea that I could potentially upgrade that, that uh, to a 1080. And, obviously, it would have to go a little bit bigger and stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm on stepchild now. It's my first year. I'm in this Mac dog video, double decade. So there was a lot of pressure and motivation for me to just, just to upgrade it. You know, I'd hit that jump a couple of times as a good jump. And I just had an idea that it could be done. So again, probably spent a lot of time in my head, like visualizing it, thinking about it. And I actually went there. Um, I had to go there on more than one occasion. I went there one time and I had like a prototype of my new pro model and it wasn't, it wasn't really up to quality and I put, put it down maybe a couple times, but kind of rolled on the landing and then it got gray. So it's, this is up in Whistler. The milk just comes in so fast there. So I couldn't, couldn't shoot anymore. So to have got so close and then to like now wait, I think I waited like two weeks for the weather and the snow to reset and clear and just to have this like eating away at me. Like I was so close. I got it. But in that time I got my official board so we went back up again and just like re-ironed it out and was able to get it like in just a couple tries. So that was that was big a big one for me because I I mean that's probably one of the only 1080s I've done on film, you know, and that's a that's a pretty big jump. And so stuff like that is important to me because I think the further I got into my career, the maybe more I kind of got pigeonholed as a street guy. And so to come that deep in my career with like a hammer like that that's like as far as i know nobody's upgraded that's like uh feels good mm-hmm. I, I feel good and <laughs> another one in that boat is cab nine grizzly gap yeah ender of that you know you're, yeah. you're known as a rail guy you cab nine grizzly gap last trick in that yeah for sure and that was a huge one for me too because that that gap's no joke like it's it's really big it's like kind of hard to measure but i would say it's probably about like 90 feet to the knuckle and it's like a step down and then you kind of got to get over this big hump you know so you're on the side of this mountain like it's kind of exposed a bit like there's active like kind of abby stuff nearby and it's like it's a it's a big ass jump you know so and the way that it was kind of set up is like that's i'd have to do it toe side you know so and i i don't mind doing switch front side off my toes like i kind of like it i can kind of pop it a certain way but that was like, so this is again back when it kind of snowed a lot more. It was like uh, probably end of May, and it was like one of the last pow days on deck. We're shooting that that movie, a lot of pressure, and I didn't have like a obvious ender really at that point yet. At least I didn't think so. And, you know, shout out Devin Walsh because he'd been over that thing a couple times. I think he, yeah, he'd hit it before. So we built it, and he was kind of, 
um, stuck in the city a little bit. So he showed up later. We kind of waited for him. I was afraid to hit it because I hadn't hit it yet. So he kind of came in last minute after it was built and just pulled up and like broke the ice on it for us. So that was that was pretty dope. Switch back five. Did he did he do be- switch back five or back seven? I can't, oh, he's back he's, seven. He's, back seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. And then uh, he might have switched back side five like a different build of it in a different video. But um, so that was dope. Once he hit that, I was like, okay, like I can see the speed and stuff. I was just worried about the, the speed, you know, because that's kind of like that's like top speed you have to go pretty much as fast as you can go to get over that thing, you know? So, and now I'm hitting a switch. Like I didn't, it's not like you go over it and try it out. You just like do your trick, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. But I remember like the landings were kind of getting, like we're running out of landings. I was probably like five or six tries into it and hadn't done it yet. And it's just like, you don't want to hit that thing more than you have to. And I was, I came down to Kearns and I was like, this thing will probably, we'll probably get another reset up here. Don't you think like I was trying to get out of it, you know? And he was just like, no, you got, you got to hit it again. Like, like it might not get good again. I was like, fuck, like I wanted somebody to give me an out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it just so happened. There was like, like I had to kind of do some calculations, some calculus to like get over to the landing that I got to, because it wasn't, that wasn't the obvious landing. You know, the first time you go off, you just kind of go and wherever you're, bomb hole is is where it is you know but now i'm like making adjustments every go which is really hard to do like over the those bigger distances you know and that yeah man when i put that down it was fucking mind altering like that was a big one for me to to get something on that and and i remember that day kern said like me and devin were up there strapped in and he was filming that top angle at that point and he said something like you guys are my heroes and i just like that i think that was like the big dad moment that i wanted so uh you can't you can't see it because when i come down in the clip and those guys are all there like Ika and devin are all there dude i'm fucking balling in those goggles really (laughs) yeah no way yeah (laughs) yeah it's just like dude to 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 go that big and stomp something and come down to those guys and it's like i knew that was like the last basically the last thing i was going to film that year and like so it's like you land it's like my part i finished filming my part into that comfort space we're talking about i know i got footage like i'm i'm good you know so emotional moment yeah yeah and this might be a good time to pull this out then Woo. have, yes. you, have you seen <laughs> that the forum chain <laughs> that's real diamonds oh, no. huh? Shit. how do i get this off yes dude this is in uh that right is that when you got it yeah that's that's when that came out. So, that's real diamonds. That thing's got some yeah, that's real diamonds. How many carrots on that bad boy? I don't know, but that cost like fifteen jump off. It did. It's a yeah, a hitter right there. What do you think about that, dude? Woof, it's a I, hitter. I want to bring that in for you to look at because I didn't. <laughs> so I, I forgot about it the other day when you came over to peep all the stuff. The form chain, so gas. That's amazing. Fifteen. I'm gonna have to rock this Woo. for a little bit. Rock it. Rock that it. is dope. Um, you ever I just rock that. that for the fun of it? Or I mean, I never really wore it snowboarding, but I rocked it steady, like when I was like on trips and stuff, or just like cruising around looking at rails. But I don't think I ever jumped with it or nothing. This thing would weigh. If you need to get over the jump, you get a little extra. A little weight. extra weight. Yeah. Now uh, another quick trick nerd thing. Sorry to just keep on staying on this, but yeah. it's important stuff to talk about because there's so many good ones. But I've feel like i want to filter down to the ones that are important in mm-hmm. picture this you weren't mm-hmm. really in the video mm-hmm. but jones had a part in it mm-hmm. and then you had those sneaky wall rides at the end which maybe if you look at that clip right now you'd be like oh wall ride but that was like that was like a very like that was uncharted territory wall ride like that or, big yeah that, at that time right yeah 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 so that was like that was kind of the period when my dad started started to get sick and that's why i didn't have much footage around that time um and I had a couple more clips, but that's they kind of did me a favor essentially and snuck those into the end of the video with Jeremy's stuff. So I was really honored to be part of that, and I I, I was really stoked on that kind of like the the transfer rodeo wall to wall thing because that was kind of I'd done like flips like that off walls before, but to kind of do it that way and start just playing around with like different geometries and stuff like that, like that kind of got me excited and kind of sparked like a. I think I saw a new lane that I could, you know, get some more tricks in, basically. It's all about finding a place where I could 
go and get my energy in and say and uh keep myself safe with more more snowboarding you know so yeah that was that was fun amazing now i'll i'll go off the trick list because we've gotten through a lot of them you know we talked switch part we talked double decade we still have some other things to talk about what we didn't talk about was the transition from um forum to stepchild we just kind of breezed yeah. over that how'd that yeah un unfold essentially how that unfolded was uh my contract was up and it was um it was now burton owned it and um so things were just kind of different it wasn't a bad thing that burton owned it but it was it was different than when it started and then devin and Ika and lowry had all picked up and gone to dc and there was a bunch of new guys came in like all great guys like jake and and pat and stuff but it it just was feeling different all of a sudden and i think i had some weird story about i'm kind of the I'm the one holding this down now. Like, I'm like, I just had this hammer part, so I'm still, you know, like, I think I was thinking that everyone was going to kind of be looking at me for guidance or something, and I, I was kind of afraid of that. And then when it came to the contract negotiations, like, the biscuits weren't hit in the same way, you know, which is understandable. And there was still actually, like, a really good contract on the table, but it just, I think I didn't, I think I didn't feel, feel like appreciated because I think and I think it had a lot to do with just just basic contract negotiation like they were probably trying to get a good deal but in that I think I kind of felt like I wasn't being appreciated maybe so I just decided like I I'd rather just do something else like I did and I didn't know what that was at the time I just knew that this is changing I don't really recognize it the same anymore and I don't want to be the one holding it all like with it's just too much pressure you know so so yeah, I just I I stayed without a sponsor cuz they had the first rider refusal thing and I just floated for a while and then um which in the in the end was kind of good because like they went out of business pretty much right a couple of years after that. So if I had a they were offering me like a 2-year deal. I think it was actually like 250, but it was like kind of incentive based, so I would have had to like do a lot of things to get it where like the 500 was just like all in. Don't even worry about photo or video incentive. We know you're going to do it, you know. This was like way more structured, so I just was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. So, I mean, I walked away from a, a big deal, like two two fifty for two years. I think is what it was. Maybe I don't even know how deep they really got in the combo because I, I had an agent at the time. Sean Kearns was my agent, so he spent a lot of time like kind of doing the numbers part, just to kind of keep myself insulated from it. But um, yeah, so I just I just walked, just stepped off, and then how did Stepchild come up? Stepchild came about, um, I think almost like they, they were kind of playing with this idea of guest pro models, like kind of how skateboard companies do that here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think that they kind of got at me like that. And I was like, well, actually, I just prefer to be totally on the team. Cause so when they dropped uh, child support and I really liked that video and that kind of reminded me a lot of like the early forum videos with like Joe's footage was, was dope. And then he's like the new guy coming up and those boys from Helsinki, like Fredu and Risto were like doing like pretty big time shit out there. And then Simone obviously like had a relationship with. So that just almost looked more familiar to me than where I thought forum was going. So I just said, I'd rather just totally get on the, the whole program. And they were like, yeah. So amazing. And yeah. that's, and that's when you, yeah, you started doing the all switch part. And then yeah. From there, there was uh, cheers and good luck. You start, you got in with the people video. Yeah, got in with the people guys and filmed those those parts. And um, it was interesting. Like during that whole time period when I was coming on to Stepchild, like my my, I mean, I had the motivation for the switch part, but um, a lot of my motivation was kind of like, especially I think Simone, like he looked up to me a lot, and I th I think Joe did too. Maybe not so much as Simone, but I was like. I don't want to let these guys down. Like I got to live up to their expectations that I don't even know if they really had of me, but that was kind of like a, a fuel that I was kind of running me on that. So I was like, cause dude, I mean, those guys were a lot younger than me and like, they weren't, they weren't like, they had parts under their belts too. Like they knew what they were doing. They weren't totally green or anything. So it's like, I wanted to hang and prove myself and I got a lot of energy off those guys. And I, I appreciate the, the way that they showed up when we filmed and stuff, it was really helpful for me mm -hmm. to kind of, I mean, I could have got with a totally different crew, wrong crew, and I could have been like, I'm over this and or something, but it really, 
I felt supported with those guys and it was dope. Mm -hmm. Love that. And and I think that, you know, from my perspective, if you look at cheers, you mm -hmm. know, looking at your career, you know, and that was the same year as that real snow, that was some of the best footage you've ever put out in your life. That's one of your best parts ever. You know, you right. air up right. McTwist on the roof, the gap back to on Harding, like yeah, yeah. that whole part is banger. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's good look. Or that's good luck. Good Sorry, luck. good yeah. luck. Cheers yeah, was cheer, cheers the one that Joe had the hairball you, ender. You on did fifty from. drop board slide on the closeout to uh, yeah that's, in Minnesota. That's okay. That's, that's cheers. got those backwards, but yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that actually was one of my favorite parts. Like speaking more recently, like that good look part. Like I did, yeah. Like I thought I did really well, and that was kind of like now we're deep into like winches and all these other ways. Like there's really kind of unlimited things you can do. So like it was kind of like the peak of, I don't know, technology for speed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Street speed and like, Street speed. and like the awareness of like what could be done with that. And so, and I was still in a good place and um, yeah, I, I, that's is one of my favorite parts. I think I have that. I have the other drop down rail, the one that you hit, you board. Boardy, boardy. Yep. Yeah. And I had the 50 to board. Yeah, you, yeah. you pioneered that thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. so like that i mean that was i was stoked on that clip and all, all those other shots like the one at harding and stuff so that was i like that part amazing well this is a good time to get into a guest question from none other than jeremy jones here we go Word. jp what's up bomb hole what's up grandies east stone what a treat what a treat for snowboarding to have you in the seat walk um excited for this episode I have a question for you. Hard to pick one. Um, so there's really nothing too deep about it. But as we were, when we were kids, our group, and we started like gaining attention around town, like people are always coming up to us and kind of broing down. We, we formulated uh, what we called the no handshake rule. So maybe talk about that, give a little context to it, and then lean into and then carry that into the spot and sort of why we constructed the spot to have that kind of confederacy of unity where our group was the contributors you to be a part of it you had to be a huge contributor and we kind of kept it a little bit elite and there's reasons for that so maybe explain that um and man i love you to pieces homie i am so proud of you and i just feel really, really lucky to have been able to snowboard by your side for so many years. And that's it. I love you. <laughs> you are my MJ of snowboarding. Peace. Word. I love you too, Jeremy. Thank you for that. Um, I think what he's talking about there is this thing we kind of came up with like a I think we we're calling it the no five list at the time because we were getting like a lot of uh people just trying to get at us and it was it was overwhelming but but looking at it like we were we were dicks like back then like we were just like <laughs> <laughs> like we talked a lot of shit and we just like that's just how we rolled you know what I mean and it wasn't like that we were trying to like think we were better than people but we kind of started making up a thing of like um well, that don't give that dude a five because he's on the no five list just to like kind of insulate ourselves. So people would come up and, and if it was like, he was a known, known guy that was on the list, but it's like, he's coming up into the crew, like with his hand out and he just like stand there and like ice grill him, like still nice to him, but like, don't offer your hand. <laughs> <laughs> So pretty <laughs> passive aggressive, I so guess. That was the no five. <laughs> that list. was the no five list. Oh, wow. Yeah, God. and and we kind of, so we ran that pretty <coughs> pretty hard for a while, and it was like, holy shit. Yeah, and and a kind of a sidebar to that around the same time, something we were doing too, which was like kind of kind of a dick thing, but we I think we had a real um, we were really possessive about all the jumps at Brighton because we like kind of found most of them. I'll just say, you know. And we, we had this thing where we kind of started telling people, like the other locals and stuff, like, if you guys want to go hit something, check with us first to make sure we're not, like, already hitting it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Hawaii surf scene. Kind of, really yeah. Like you yeah. guys uh, grew here. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's, like, all love, but definitely we, like, had, a, like, a bit of a dick thing going, too. And just, but really just kind of wanting to, like, 
keep people in check and just keep a respect thing, I guess, you know, and just not get it blown out, you know. Would, were people checking in? People checked in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, is it cool if I go up to this Yeah, jump? yeah, yeah. Because there was... Are you guys going to be there this day? Right. Realistically, there's only like a couple jumps at Brighton. They're like film worthy back in those times. So it's like, those are the ones you're really like... Swimming pool or... Yeah, swimming yeah, pool or like something else. Pool. Maybe like Evergreen Gap when it was like not so hot over there, you know. But it's like, you want you want those on deck for yourself, I guess, if you pioneered them and you're trying to get clips, you know. So definitely like a possessive kind of possession. What, what happened thing. to Evergreen Gap? I don't know. I think did they change like it's yeah, kind of... they must have changed the terrain, huh? Yeah, they might have put like a cat track in the right out or something it over there. It just disappeared one year. Yeah. But, and um, part two is the spot. Yeah, I think it's just kind of that's kind of the vibe of, of the spot, you know, is we really just wanted to create a place that we could kind of practice and not be bothered, you know, and not bothered because we don't like people, but just because we, we do, or I guess I'll just say for me, like I need time to kind of be with myself and my board and, and my process to kind of figure stuff out for the year. And that's a really important time for me in the beginning of the season to work through stuff I've been thinking about or try new stuff out. And if I have to um, share that, I guess I get tight. You know what I mean? And I'm okay for sharing and stuff like that. And I also want people to have the same respect for it that I do. And I, so I guess that's me wanting people to be maybe different than they are, but that's, and so I guess I have an expectation around how I want people to be. I'll just say it like that. And I don't know if that's realistic to have that expectation, but that's my preference. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you show up, you shovel. Yeah, that would be my preference, you know. And, and it's not that I have, like, a, a bad judgment about somebody that just wants to come up and ride or whatever. It's just that that's the way that I do it. And so I guess I want that from other people. So Also, a uh, deep question. Yeah. Maybe a hard question. J.P. Walker of today, that's the caretaker, looking back at J.P. Walker then. Yeah. Any regrets on no fives? and? Yeah, I mean, that's, pre that's pretty rude, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but life, you know, back then, you were J.P. Walker, larger than life. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, like, I can give myself any kind of cognitive escape route to get out of and be like, I was just trying to make myself safe or keep distance or whatever, but, like... You know, I, d I don't have, like, big regrets about that. I hope I didn't hurt anybody with that because that was not my intention. I think my intention was just to, like, keep it with my boys and keep us in our squad. You know, I, I, I think I am protective of my crew and my friends, and I maybe somehow was, was feeling outside pressure, and this is, like, somehow a threat maybe to me or something that people want to get a piece of us or maybe – take my friend away from me i don't know yeah, sometimes don't know. too it's Deep just down. nice to not have everyone see you shredding yeah. in the early season when you're warming up as, as yeah. the pro that you are for sure yeah there's another sidebar thing we got to talk about because you make it seem like oh you go up shovel i have expectations but these are also maniacs because like i went up there he was like, oh, we camped the night. Like, I slept up there. It fucking sucked, dude. Digging a grave? Horrible. Is that what you and, guys call it? And, yeah, and yeah. then there's also, like, the crazy story about Simone getting off a plane, and you guys just gave him a GPS unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just, like, a waypoint. Like, waypoint or whatever. Here. He's, like, coming up in the middle of the night, just no, has no idea where it's at, just hiking for somewhere. But we were in the woods, like, spying on him, making sure he wasn't going to get lost. But Didn't you have to sleep up there alone, too? Was yeah, that, that was kind of part of the deal, like, spend, spend the night up there alone. It's just, like, you don't have to but it's definitely like a stat you know what i mean but yeah we we you know we we you we, there was a lot of hazing going on for sure like <laughs> yeah. like people people came through and it's like i think at one point um yeah like i think pat moore was trying to we'd call it prospecting he was trying to prospect up there at the spot and it's like now here comes like a squad of I'll just call them skiers or something are coming up and they want to ski. And I'm like, that's a, that's a no go right now for me, you know? And I've told enough skiers to, to leave. So, um, Pat, you got to do it. And, and <laughs> cause I'm, I don't, nicest guy, Pat Moore. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to get like, I mean, I'm okay with taking some heat, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I don't want to be taking it for other people that are trying to get a piece too, you know? So like kind of like sick in the dogs on people, you know? So and nothing against skiers, just like it's my safe space that I'm trying to work this stuff out, and I, I don't want to share. 
Like basically, I don't want to share. Well, yeah, there's you also built it. The thing, too, is that you got to think. You take the rails, you weld them, yeah. you put them in the back of the truck, you haul them up there, you build the lip. There is a degree of, like, we actually put in all the work here, and you yeah. guys put in zero work. So. Yeah. You ever yeah. catch people up there? Jeremy caught people up there. He He camped up there for his solo camp thing. So he's up there in the middle of the night by himself. He should probably tell this story, but he's up there in the middle of the night by himself. Got a little fire going, getting comfortable, getting ready to like pack it in. He hears he hears something in the woods. So he like, okay, oh shit. Like he puts the fire out, kind of like cleans the scene up and he just get, gets quiet. And sure enough, like these group of, I think it was a bunch of skiers brought like lights and generator up to, to set it up because we've been regulating so hard there. Like, well, we got to go up there at night to get a piece. Just so happened, Jeremy was camping up there dolo <laughs> that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he like... He, Did they back down? He popped out with like a flashlight on his face. And I think he had like a hatchet and some other stuff on him, you know. So it's like, that's probably pretty scary. Yeah. You know? And they were tripping and he like was just like, no, this isn't happening. They, yeah, they fell back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, they probably like, we're going to show those fuckers. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait till this edit oh, comes dude, out. <laughs> yeah. We were, uh, I was like, I'm going to get like wild dogs and chain them to these handrails like i was just like on another level of like i need like to regulate this you know? is my space yeah and it's like it's all love i appreciate anyone come up i'm totally open to all that stuff now but in the end i really i think it was like i'm viewing this as a threat to my identity in snowboarding because people are gonna this is gonna impact my time to create or get better at snowboarding somehow because i've other people are here and that's really what it is. It all came from fear, I would say. All right. Let's get into the pub beer crap shoot. Welcome to the pub beer crap shoot. How's that pub beer, bud? So good. My yeah. Dog. Uh, so if you're thinking about drinking one or 40 beers, what are you going to get? You're going to get a pub beer every time. It's cheap, fun, delicious. These would have been nice up at the spot for the people that did drink beer. Word. All right, so now there's some dice around here. Buds, have you seen those things anywhere? I don't know where these dice are. All right, well, we lost our dice, so you just have to pick a number between 2 and 12. Oh, I do? Yep, normally between, you'd roll dice for this. Between 2 and 12. Mm. 11. Oh, this is good. If you had to be Siamese twins with one person in the industry, who would you pick to be stuck with? This is for me? Yes, yeah, for you. I mean, I'm already Siamese up with Jones. Yeah, so that's what I figured. I mean, <laughs> I'll just let that ride. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah. That's easy money right easy. there. All right. I have a Patreon question from Board Progression. What are your thoughts on the industry change with social media and how pro riders now have to show a bit more of themselves than just video and magazine releases? Um. <clears throat> I don't know how qualified I am to really speak on this because I've kind of been on hiatus from social media to a, to a degree. But um, I think it's, I mean, it's different, you know. I don't know if that's expected of writers to kind of show themselves more, or be more outgoing to kind of speak to their fan base or if or sponsors want their, their writers to be like that. I don't know. I can say for me that... Um, I've been pretty distant from, from social media because I kind of can't really, I don't really have the capacity for it in, in as far as like um, self-compassion wise. It's like uh, I can really hurt myself with it. So it's like I if I go on there, it's just like I, I guess the way I interpret it is like look at all this stuff that I am should be doing or look how this guy's doing it and I'm not or whatever, really can, can compare myself to it. And then, you know, I might start on, like, some skate clips and I'm watching some snow worrying. Next thing you know, I'm, like, looking at, like, a chick in a thong. And I'm, like, how did I, how did I even get here? How like, did this I is, get here? You know what I mean? And, like, however many minutes have gone by. So I Hours kinda, can go by. Hours, yeah. So I just kind of kicked out of it because my nervous system, I don't think, can handle that after kind of mm -hmm. what I've been through. It's just I don't have much room to kind of elevate the same way I used to. And so I've been pretty distant that so i don't i don't really know what's going on too much with it the, almost one of the last times i went on instagram i was like the buttons were all in a different place and i didn't it took me a minute to figure out how to like do something so i'm like i'm kind of off point with that you know i think that's but, a good thing but it's it's different than it was for sure question question two since you're off of it 
you've been on it. Uh, do you feel that you're, there's like life uh, kind of easy, ha- ha- like life hacks, like life's better without it? Have you noticed that? I, I think for me it is. It's like um, I, I've kind of tried to do something with my phone altogether to distance myself from it. So when I open up my phone, the screen's totally <laughs> blank. There's nothing on there because... For me, what happens is normally I would go on it and just start going in almost unconsciously with, with like, I'm going to do this. And like I say, now I'm deep on Instagram. And, oh, I actually came here to send an email or call somebody and like, what the fuck even happened? You know, so I, it's easy for me to get hijacked. So I keep it blank. And so when I go on, I have to, I like do the thing where you swipe down and type in like the, the app. So it's like, it's all with intention. Like, this is actually what I want to do. I want to go on and get an email. So I'm going to type in mail, it brings it up and I can choose it. And I, I do feel like a little more even with that. Like, I think it is a more comfortable place to be because, well, when's the last time you guys went on there and got off and went, Oh, God, I feel so good after that. Never. Maybe yeah. after, maybe after like uh, you put up like a hammer clip and yeah, you get some props. Yep, that's true. For sure. You want to be checking for that. Like, I'm not saying that I'm not, I'm not doing that, but it's like, I get a I get a dopamine hit or whatever from that. It feels good. But if I'm just cruising, and never I never really come off of a cruise and feel good. You know, I feel like damn, I'm slipping or something. You know, mm-hmm. I got to get a better this or that. So mm-hmm. I think for me, it's a better look. You know, that's good. That's why those are wise words. Now, uh, just to kind of fully just kind of wrap up the whole uh, list of of you know parts. We the. The last few, I don't have my notes in front of me, but you have you have a couple of gibberish parts. You mm-hmm. had the fakey five forty mm-hmm. onto the or four four fifty rather, mm-hmm. um, and then you had uh, v- video grass vis- or I guess that was the last one, and then you, we did twenty thirty two together. Right. So those you want to kind of maybe we'll just call that a chapter if you yeah. want to talk about any yeah, of that. I stuff. think that's a good chapter. I mean, so after um, people ended, um, I kind of was like, well, I want to keep filming, so we and. By then, it's like a lot of things are going online or straight to just parts and stuff like that. Like you, you probably had a big part in that with your pull fart thing, yes. just like straight online. To the, yeah, yeah. So it was like that's obviously kind of the direction it's going. So we kind of panicked into like the the gibberish thing, and it, it, that's not some of my favorite stuff. But I do have some like hammer clips in there that I'm like really excited about, like that uh, fakey four fifty. That's like something I want to do for a while. So. It was kind of like a, a a way to kind of keep it going when like it was a challenging time with people going away and stuff like that. And just production companies in general kind of like falling off, you know, there's not, there was kind of like a, yeah, like a calling or something almost of these things. So, so I was stoked to have the opportunity to be able to do that and put those parts out. And then, uh, 2032, that was, so that would have been the 20th video part that I shot. And so I obviously put a lot of pressure on myself with that. And, I was coming back from a, a foot injury from the year before that um, kind of rocked me pretty good. And I didn't realize how bad it rocked me until I had gone out to Tooele to this reservoir spillway and set up this feature that I wanted to do. So I, I broke my foot the year before, did all this rehab, got it as good as I could, and then was feeling pretty good and just tried to step back into the to the board. And then when I got out there and had this thing all built, I like kind of had this like flashback of like falling and getting hurt again. Like I did. Cause this thing is like set up where I could fall again from pretty high and, and hurt my foot. So I, uh, I was like done. I was like the night before I had to go out there and shoot that. I was like cuddled up on the floor. Like I can't do it. Felt totally shaky and just, just no desire to even do it. Just like totally in, in, in flight, you know, I got to, I can't, I can't do this. And Roberta like somehow just talked me into it. She was just like, I know you can do it. And I, I basically just listened to her cause I didn't have nothing in me said that I could do this anymore. You know, it was just weird. Cause I, I wrote at the spot all preseason for that and felt good. But now when I'm like back up, like getting filmed and about to hit this big feature, it was just like overwhelming. So went out there somehow did it. It's like, I stepped up to like lip slide on mm-hmm. that big bank and came in and then, uh, after that, I like instantly started like looking up like sports psychologists online and stuff and just trying to like get to the bottom of that. So I did some work like online while I was filming for that movie just to try to like get support somehow. 
so that that was a pretty big struggle to get through that that year you know and not to mention like you guys are all coming up like super hungry and stuff and this is my main sponsor and I want to like do good for that it was, it was a lot you know and um once that video came out I had a lot more space to kind of work on myself and get through this kind of PTSD I was having about getting hurt again you know and I can totally see how when something like that happens or maybe to other pros that I've seen kind of like just peace out like I get it like something happens and you're just like it that's it I'm done it's enough you know I was totally there where I could have just been like I'm, I'm over it but I like stayed in probably because I had the demons and I was scared to like look at anything else and I like worked with this sports psychologist guy and got through the the event that was kind of holding me back and then um luckily had the opportunity to film with video grass like the year after that so video so justin shout out meyer it's our boy big old air horn. big old yeah so he 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 shot for the 32 movie so i was already been out with those guys and then he was going to do another video grass production and like asked me to be part of that which i'm super grateful for so i i really appreciate the fact that he i don't know i think i have a story that maybe i'm aged out at that point or i don't deserve to be in those films because he's definitely like like his films and stuff are like generations way later than mine you know so to still be kind of part of what he's got going and all your guys stuff is just like uh, i'm grateful you know so and i guess uh it was cool because I really, I was really stoked on that part I had for visitors. Like I thought I came through with like some pretty hard footage and um, kind of got myself back to a place of like, this is where I, this is where I knew I could get to and I'm here now and maybe, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but I remember I was like, in the morning before I'd go film, I'm like trying to stretch and do all this stuff. And I'm just like, <laughs> have you guys ever seen Boogie Nights? Oh, yeah. You know, when he's like trying to get his dick hard. Yep. He's like, I felt like I was like that. I was like, because my foot still hurt. And I was like massaging. I'm just like, just one more time. Like, we could do this <laughs> one more time. <laughs> you know, what I mean? I'm trying to like talk myself into it because I'm like, and I did that for 2032 a lot. And then visitors came around. I was still doing that. I was like, dude, what are you doing? Like you kind of just asked your body to do this thing and it did it. And now you're here doing it again. Like what the fuck, you know? So, but I actually showed up pretty good for that section and did a lot of dope stuff, new stuff like that. I started stepping into like the one foot stuff that you guys had a big handle on for many years. And so that was, that was new for me. And then stone, you shot that clip. That yeah, switch. that was dope. Yeah. It's an exciting moment. Yeah. Switch Mickey one foot. Switch Mick one foot. And that's something I'd kind of actually been thinking about for a while for some reason, even before I really wanted to try out one foot stuff that, I mean, I like switch Mick twists. I do them a lot. It just seemed, and I'd done them kind of on all these different things. It seemed like that was maybe a one foot thing I could do of all things. Who knows? <laughs> but, um, yeah. So to, to get that and it just, I felt like I was back from like all the kind of stuff that happened at a place that I was just kind of content with, you know, especially, you know, I'm 41 or something. I'm in the streets out here still getting it. Just like a kind of like overwhelming, you know? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. Been doing it at that point for 20 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you start doing that's cause a crazy thing to think when you're, when you're 16, 17, you know, you're maybe 18, you're in Whitey's movies you know, fast forward, you're 41. That's, you know, 20 plus years of, of every winter pushing yourself as hard as you can. Dude. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's a lot. It takes a toll. It's a lot for sure. You know, and it kind of just like when you're in it, it, it doesn't really seem like a lot, but when it, you know, it stops and then you can kind of step back and look at it. It's like, whoa, that, that is a lot. Like when you read out those stats, I'm like, whoa, that, that is a lot. And I've been kind of reflecting a lot lately about what I've done just because I was coming in here and I'm like, dude, this has been a lot. And, uh, yeah. And I think um, in regards to that, there's like something that kind of comes up for me if you guys don't mind me sharing. Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's do it. This is so weird because I never really thought that 
I would even be saying this, but I guess like uh, when Roberta was coming out of the hospital, so she's she's out of her acute rehab and she's 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 home now. So that's like a couple months later. I uh, I had this idea of like, well, I heard a lot about like dancing can help with like people that have like brain stuff like Alzheimer's and things like that. And it can just be good for like rehab, you know. So I, and I also was like so afraid that she was going to get hurt. So I'm like, I'll just, since I'm this controller of her at this point, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to, I'll just, I'll just, I'm going to make her into this super graceful dancer because dancers don't fall. They're, you know, graceful and elegant and they're safe, safe. It seems safe, you know, and then she can get help with her brain injury by learning how to dance or whatever. So I went to a, it's crazy that this is like hitting me like this, but, um, I went to a, a dance studio by my house in California, this, this place in Solana beach called Arthur Murray. They have a bunch of dance studios. There's, there's one here actually. And, um, I just said, can I bring my wife here for, for rehab, you know? And they, they're like, yeah, for sure. I guess that that kind of happens on occasion. People that just, just do something different, rewire your brain, like kind of connect your, cause you can re, um, you can build new neural pathways. That's kind of the great thing about the brain thing. And then, so she could do some rebuilding of that and kind of my story is it would connect with her body and kind of just be a good thing. So we started doing that <laughs> and I got pretty stoked on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like it's kind of it's kind of like I th- I th- I think I have this uh <coughs> like double life that I, no one knows about till now. <laughs> 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 and I guess I'm like scared to talk about it because I'm this I think I'm this JP Walker inside this box that only knows how to snowboard and do more gnarlier snowboarding. But the kid's been on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> so dope. Dude, that's rad. Yeah. So I like I got pretty excited about this this dance shit, dude. It's crazy. So like <laughs> I was going there just with the full intention of like, this is good for Roberta, but then now, cause I haven't been I, at this point, I haven't done anything besides be her caretaker, but now I'm actually moving my body, trying to have game and some, and some style stuff that I'm typically used to snowboarding and skating. Right. Except for like, this is safe, you know? And I do have like a desire for like a, uh, physicality and like human connection and stuff like that and that's in there too obviously so i, I didn't really see it coming but it's kind of like uh checking a lot of boxes for me you know something you can do with your lady too right yeah and that was the thing too is like I, this will be fun for us to do it won't be like uh she has so many different rehabs and like elastic band fun. or stretches yeah. It's, it's yeah it's rehab and this is like we can go do this together and have fun you know so that was the the whole intention in the beginning, but now it's like I'm out there ballroom dancing. <laughs> what are you, yeah, what are you <laughs> talking? So I want to know sick, about yeah. this shit. What, ballroom dancing, like twirling around. What yeah, are you yeah. Like I'm it's doing an art form, right? Yeah, I'm doing like so. I like to do like more like the Latin dances, which are like the the rhythm dances. So it's like salsa, bachata, cha cha, like these kind of things, you know. And so like go peep a bachata video online. You'll see what what the kids all about, you know. <laughs> Definitely and I mean, I'm not, this. I just, I've been just only been at it a couple of years since this whole thing happened, but it's fun. And, and I, and there's a, you know, there's other ones like, uh, I really like Argentine tango, which is like, um, it's tango, but it's like you hold really close with each other and you go slow and kind of do these weird intricate things between each other's legs and kick and it's all feel, you know, all feel. So it's kind of, I like that, you know, and it's. There's routines, but it's all improvised. So it's like, 
you you have to really connect with your partner to do it, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and then I'm doing, like, uh, waltz and foxtrot and swing and, like, all of them. I'm it's out there it's doing like it. Learning, it's <laughs> like, like learning tricks, right? Yeah, 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 up the dance yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that's the thing is it's, like, it's interesting because I'm trying, now that I have, like, kind of this new awareness about it, I think we're calling it the demons at this point that, that's kind of driving the snowboarding. I know that I can do that. And I'm actually uh, consciously not trying to be the best dancer in the world. I'm just like doing it for fun. Trying to have fun. Yeah. yeah. And it's super fun. And it's like, I want to do more of it. And it's kind of saving my ass. That's cool. When you see a good dancer too, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, that's it's just, just like, dope. yeah, yeah. You see it, and you're. Who like, doesn't wow. like watching dancing, dude? I yeah. love it. Yeah, I might have a clip. We could like sub in. Yeah, here. let's yeah. drop a clip. <laughs> let's drop a clip. That's so rad, dude. Yeah. Very unexpected, but yeah. that's what a, awesome, man. What a yeah. dope ass curveball. Yeah. It. So it's like I. It's just weird for me to share because I think I. I don't know. I can get creative about a story about like I'm disappointing my fans somehow because i'm not this hardcore i think no, you know what, like you better you know, the <laughs> most inspiring story you can come up with is when somebody is just themselves like they're yeah. just truly this is who they are take it or leave it and and I, that is actually the rarest thing you see in humans these days and so when you're like i found dancing i you can, found I can fuck like. up the dance floor like yeah that is so gas <laughs> like yeah. what like, yeah and, and it's and it's totally like scary and unfamiliar and foreign and like we're skaters and snowboarders and we're cool guys and you fucking you know it's like it's a totally different you know yeah. we have our our safety net of our culture and you're just going into the left field and it's dope dude <laughs> it's so dope <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited about it. I did not see it coming at all. And I, I see now that I kind of have this new awareness about why it's hitting so hard for me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm stoked. I found it for sure. And, and yeah, I, I, I'm still snowboarding. I'm still obviously sponsored. I'm running for 32 in Santa Cruz. And, and, and it's like, this is the first time, I think this is kind of another hard part about it for me. This is kind of one of the first times that if snowboarding was like the closest thing to me, it's like kind of not now. I think that's just going to happen, right? As life goes on, right? And it's like you're finding new paths and new things you like, and snowboarding's there too. You just ride when when it feels right. It's hard though. Here's the thing, though, too, and I know that I know that must be hard for you, but snowboarding might not be that thing to you, but you're our Wayne Gretzky, mm -hmm. you're our Michael Jordan. You're our guy, no matter what. So yeah. it's like you, whatever the relationship is with you, you're our guy. Like, yeah. So you can, you know, you're always going to be beloved by the. Yeah, I just don't want to disappoint anybody. I mean, dude, you're growing up. It's just yeah. part of life, right? Yeah. I don't know. I just when you when you recite that stat list and then you put like the the dancing in there. I don't know. Does it like. Uh, it raises it up. Does it raise it up or does it, I guess my story is it like invalidates it somehow. You know what I mean? I think it's dope. But uh, No, we should encourage people think, yeah, to do people what they want to do, do with yeah. their life. You need to be Doesn't you matter. and what makes you feel good. Yeah. And do something with your loved one. That's a great yeah. thing. Yeah. It's a good skill to have. Does too, she like general. it as much as you do? She doesn't like it as much as <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's about trying to like get back on her surfboard. and, and Yeah, just a different mission. Yeah, she's on a different mission, and she likes it, but I definitely like it more than her, I think, which is cool. And from the instructors that I talk to and stuff, they say that it's obviously normal that one partner would like it more. It's yeah. usually just the reverse, you know what I mean? So, so shout out uh, my dance teachers, Ash and Damien. <laughs> <laughs> so dope. Shout out, Ash and Damien. Um, cool. We're going to hit um, one, one thing we always do on the show is hot takes. Word. So we just kind of rip through like your take on uh, you know you don't have to do a rapid fire, but just it's just a couple of quick okay. quick questions. Uh, you know, and for you, w this is an interesting one. But uh, first one we always ask is who is your Michael Jordan and or goat of snowboarding, both male and female? Who you got? Mm. I mean, I gotta say Jeremy for sure. He's he's my boy. He's definitely my goat. And then um, for females, I would have to say, 
Well, I'm going to say my wife, Roberta, she was a professional snowboarder. That's how we met. And we were on the same team together. So, and those are the two people closest to me. So when did you guys start dating? Like 97, I Damn. think. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, next question we ask is most underrated. Most underrated? Chad Otterstrom. Wow. Dude's out here getting it still. Yeah. <laughs> still. I think. I don't know. That's I'm a good just, answer. I'm just going to hit him with Chad Otterstrom. I think that I don't think we've gotten that one. And I think that's a fucking a great much one. needed one. Um, okay, Steeler Pal. <laughs> Still, son. that's a stupid question. Sorry, a stupid question. I just shouldn't ask that. Uh, best style and best style ever. I'm gonna say Nate Cole. Actually, like he had, he was back when rails were still really like people were really still figuring out. He was able to make it look good even back then. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say Nate Cole. Good answer. Great answer. Uh, best board graphic ever. I'm gonna say Joe Sexton's first pro model with the cereal. I don't think that. I don't know if that was it or not. But Joe Sexton's bass holes. Oh uh, yeah, that was, sick. That, that was a good sick. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pants over or under the high back? I don't know. I spent about an equal time in both worlds, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say over. That's OG. Yeah, I'm gonna keep it OG. Do you still rock it like that? I don't because no. I'm running more like a jogger fit on my pants. Oh, gotcha. So it doesn't, doesn't really play like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you go heli boarding with three people in the world, who are you going with? Just for fun, just to get after it, get some pow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It'd be fun to go heli boarding with Jeremy. We never went heli boarding. We're just always too busy working. It'd be fun to go Jeremy. Peter Lyon, just go with the old squad and Duffacy. Wow. Yeah. That's a great that's a great looking heli right there. Okay, and the last one. Um worst trend. What do you got? Worst trend? Like snowboard related or just life in general? Doesn't matter. Take it however uh, you want. Either or. Worst trend is maybe. Damn, I don't know, dude. It's kind of, I'm so out of the loop on snow, I don't even know what the trends are. So <laughs> maybe like, <laughs> oh, filler. <laughs> <laughs> filler, filler in the wow. video part. <laughs> I love that's that. Just, that's just a never really played. I love that answer. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, well, we still got a couple other things to, to talk about, but I got a, I, we got a little gift for you. Oh, word. We got something that's special. Okay. Uh, this is from the bomb hole. Oh. And we just wanted to get something. Which side should you? This is the top. That's The top is facing you. Okay. We wanted to get you something just to um, appreciate everything you've done for the whole damn sport, really. You know? Really? Yeah, dude. Just for <laughs> what you've done for this, this in, the years of inspiration and progression and steering the sport in the right direction. Just something, something that's just needed for a goat like yourself. <laughs> so sick. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Buds, what does it say for the listeners that can't see it? Bombhole presents Legend Award, JP Walker. I appreciate you guys. Well deserved. Thank you so much. We appreciate everything you've done, JP. All the freaking oh. blood, sweat, and tears on the battlefield you left out there. I really appreciate that, and this means a lot to me. Um, I have something for you guys. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, I'm, shit. It's, um... In here. I feel like I kind of just glossed over that. It's, like, kind of hard for that. Award to for me to let that land right now. No, so that's, like, okay. I, that's okay. I think it's gonna like kind of sort of land over, over a little bit, but I appreciate. <laughs> no worries. I appreciate that. But I have one of my old Trans World Awards that I thought I'd leave with you guys. Oh wow! 2001 JP Walker Best Rail Rider. Oh snap! Yes. I don't, I don't know if like uh, you guys got a spot for that. Yeah, we gotta find some we, prime real estate yeah. maybe on the set. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. Wow. 
yeah, this is incredible, dude. We're turning into like a, a museum, yeah. and now we got like we're actually have real stuff that's like, <laughs> dude, that thing sick. is sick. Oh one, uh, oh one resistance. That would have been for um, true life. I true think. life. Yeah. Okay. But Fuck yeah. This you got a stack of those. Thank or what? you. I got JP. a cu- couple of those, but this is like kind of more important than all those like those ones kind of just landed in my lap like literally where this one is like you kind of got to earn, earn this one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so i i really appreciate it guys thank you dude no you were yeah. right. ethan and chris dude well we have a couple other things to cover before we wrap it up um we always like to ask about the rider's setups and i know you got to talk about those damn bindings too all right and do I do I need to swoop it or is it? Can I just talk about it? Just talk about it. Yeah, because you got to yeah. use the mic. So yeah, um, I've pretty much been on like the same size boards for my whole career, which is like one forty seven or one forty eight for handrails, and then one fifty four for everything else, like uh, just backcountry and jumps and stuff like that. Even that big jump. Uh, everything, all my and biggest jumps, pleasures. yeah, everything was all on a 54, maybe maybe deviated a little between 53 and 55. Wow. But 54 is the sweet spot for me, like like on e- deepest day, biggest jump, that's just what I like. And I like twin tip boards, minimal camber, but camber for sure. And um, don't do, I don't do any detuning of the edges or anything like that. I just let it, let it ride. Really? Then, yeah. On, on a big board. I know some people detune the tips or mm. whatever. For my uh, rail setup, I definitely dull the edges on that. I used to go like ham, like full around like like the grinder a couple passes, then go in and clean it up with the file. Now I'm kind of trying to just hand file the middle a little bit just to kind of, I don't know, if I'm, if I'm going into the street, I definitely want the whole thing rounded, but now there's kind of so many parks and situations where I'm like kind of riding the mountain, but also want to jump on something. So I, kind of like a bit of edge for that but um same thing like a cam cambered board may i i've did a flat camber for a while but um or just a flat board for a while but it's kind of got to be stiffer for that and then uh i the the big thing i guess is like the bindings that i use which are the same bindings that i have been using pretty much my whole career like i got them they were like the second year form made bindings so i think they were they came out in like 2000 maybe and they're aluminum base plates because i i liked like i like tech nine style bindings yeah. like i loved the baseless bindings i really liked the idea of just being standing on the snowboard directly connected and i rode uh pbs bindings do you remember the, yep. that brand so i rode those and then the the next bindings that came out i really liked were like these old ride bindings the preston bindings. oh yeah those are metal yeah and so i rode those for a while and essentially the the bindings I'm writing now are like the original Prestons. They're just a sheet of like aluminum and that's it. They never bent or anything on you. Never bent. Yeah. So wow. I, I have, I actually have three pairs that I kind of rotate between so I can have like two boards set up at a time, but they're the same from the same era. That's crazy. Yeah. So like my whole career has been on this, like two sets or three sets of bindings, essentially like pretty much everything I ever did is on these sets. And it's, you didn't have to change out straps. I changed out the straps. Okay. I like upgraded the straps. Like they have like Burton, nice Burton ratchets and stuff on yeah. them like that. And I'll switch those out cause they just blow out. But the high back, the hill cup, the base plate is all like they're antiques and they're, they're good. And he has a whole <laughs> parts uh, yard yeah. in his, in his yeah. shop. I have to kind of roll with like, um, like a little kit, like a little tune-up kit that's got like all, because there's so many, um, because they're not like a unibody thing that's all bolted together. So it's like I have to have all the specific parts so when the the hardware breaks or gets rusty or blows out. So I got to always have that on deck when I roll because it's, that's not, I can't go to a shop and get a replacement pair. Yeah, you got this uh, (laughs) 20-year-old screw from... uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then, yeah, and and in my garage, I have like a parts bin where I've kind of just stripped them all down so I can kind of grab at stuff and keep them tuned up all the time but it's kind of like a that's what i do i go i go up to the spot or snowboarding anywhere come home dump all my gear off like get everything pull my board kind of just have like an intimate moment with my bindings and a screwdriver and just go over and tune and make sure everything's good and just get like real comfortable with it and and for me it's like that's the connection to the snowboard is through the binding so it's like no matter what boots or board if i feel that the, it, myself click in that way it's really easy to get fat or really easy to get used to new setups and stuff like that and i just 
know a lot more what to expect because it's really familiar. So that's super amazing. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> love that with the bindings. Oh. And then what about waxing and tuning? Uh, like how are you a wax God or are you just kind of, I mean, I'll, I'll wax God my full size, like my board, if I'm going to go red pow, just cause I don't want to be slow or anything like that. But jib board, I kind of, I actually don't really like to wax it because I have an idea that maybe it's too slippery for like presses and stuff and you can kind of skirt out. So I, I like it a bit raw, but I don't want it to be, you know, I, I actually run like a, like a wide painter blade, like a, like a flat, um, razor blade and I'll kind of just go over my base and clean like any little burrs or like little things from the stairs off of it to keep it kind of, kind of fresh, you know, but, um, so no wax on the jib board. Unless what, I, what board is it? Is this, it's a Santa Cruz. Santa, right? Santa Cruz, J.P. Walker. Yeah, one forty-seven. I'll 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 scrape that up and keep it keep it clean, but no wax. But full size board. I'll 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 probably go wax gun on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Love it. And I think you, do you say you have a giveaway for? Um, the, yeah, I have I have a new Santa Cruz board. Um, it's the one that's out right now. It's my first Santa Cruz Pro model, and it's a. Uh, it's like all camouflage, like snow camo, similar to like one of my old form pro models. So it's kind of like a throwback to that. And it's got like the Santa Cruz, like screaming hand logo, except for it's like a Yeti version. So it's all like furry and stuff. And it's not brand new because I took like a couple of laps on it, but it's basically brand new. So I'm, I'm giving that away. Well, I was thinking what we could do is comment on the YouTube and, uh, whoever comment why you, sh why you should have that, uh, Screaming Hand, Santa Cruz, J.P. Walker. And we'll go through the comments and we'll find the best comment and we'll reach out to you and we'll send you the board. So I think that's a good way to give it away. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds great. Cool. Yeah. That necklace looks pretty good on you, Doug. Oh, I feel good. I feel like I'm like... <laughs> Get about to get shot by like Rob <laughs> Mathis and be like in a fucking carousel in true life. <laughs> um, another thing, real quick, we should talk about because we breezed over the the Forum Street Dweller. As you're mm, talking about that, mm -hmm. you know that board was kind of iconic. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what was the deal with it? That was and that. So that was actually my idea and, and my whole uh, like intention behind that was sell more boards. You know, like so let's make something that you know, people are going to buy their normal board to go to the mountain, but then spend money on something else to go ride in the street. Cause it's, I don't know how realistic it is for like the average consumer to be buying like a couple different boards. Like they're expensive. You know, I could have ne never afforded like a couple boards when I was younger. So I don't want to thrash my good board. So like, let's make something that's cheaper. So it didn't have edges on it. It's strictly meant to ride the steel. So it's probably got that probably didn't even have a wood core, like the cheapest board you could make basically. And I think it sold for like a hundred bucks or something like that. So it's, that's not far outside of like a skateboard. No edges I mean. too. No edges. So it's like, yeah. And I don't know how well it did, but it as those boards are actually really good for riding aluminum because like you can't really be fucking with aluminum with an edged board. You know what I mean? Like board slides and stuff like that. So I always kept like one on deck for like those rare situations where I was getting up on aluminum instead of steel. So that was kind of where that came from. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, JP, it's been a hell of a chat. Uh, we want, we should also, what, what's what's next for JP? What do we got next on the docket? I mean, well, we got some dances coming up. I'll, I'll tell you, like, I'm, I'm kind of excited about, I want to do a trip to Buenos Aires. For, Sick. For some immersive uh, Argentine tango dance. Uh, experience and I might do that sometime in the winter because it'll be their summer so I'm I'm kind of curious about doing something like that and then I plan on doing like some more therapy and personal growth stuff and actually thinking about that right now real quick I want I don't know how this we can figure this out or if this will work for you guys but uh, I talked with Roberta and we wanted to do something where we would offer to pay somebody's tuition at one of the programs at, at the Haven that we did. So it's like a, the program's called come alive and would pay for that's like 2,200 bucks Canadian. If someone is like in need of support or hurting or something like that. So maybe, I don't know, something like in the comments, like 
JP and Roberta send me to the Haven and then we'll maybe do like a lottery or something and pick yeah. a person. Do we have a lot of people that reach out with, yeah. s- with some serious he, stuff? And Yeah. And this helps deal with trauma and people that are having hard times. Yeah. It's just, it's just like a, it's like a group therapy retreat thing. And it's like a, it's like a five day thing. It's up in, in Canada and BC and Gabriel and, and me and Roberta would be willing to send somebody there that mm-hmm. if they think that that would be helpful for them. So Dude, that's huge. Yeah. 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 It was, it's been really helpful for me to to do all that stuff. So I don't know where I'd really be at without having that kind of support. That's a good, that that's a really good thing to highlight too, because you're a person that, I mean, you're a person that went through some serious uh, trauma, you and Roberta both, you and, you know, for that person that's maybe hopeless, that's, that's life got turned upside down for him. Like, I, I think that you you kind of were able to find a, a navigate a path that, that's helped you a lot. Um I don't know. I guess this is kind of a corny question, but do you do you have any words for that person, like you when you were at your lowest? You know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because when you're in that place, I guess I can only say for me, it's really hard to see other options. You know, so I know that when I was really struggling and down, it's like I I can only really focus and get creative about these two really bad things, and and it's hard to to kick yourself off this like neurotic loop about like there's no way out basically. And so I think the biggest thing is just to tell somebody what's happening and reach out and get support. Because I think for me, when I'm in those places and and I'm going down, it just seems hopeless. So there's, there's, there's nothing, there's, it's almost too much to even ask somebody to like pause and try to breathe. It's like, I think reaching out and making connection with somebody is, is the way to, is the way for me to kind of, take care of myself when that's going on so i don't know if that works for anybody else but Mm -hmm. that's kind of where i'm at with that and places like it's called the haven yeah it's called the haven and we'll we'll link it in the show Show notes notes. for the audio and youtube um show notes and and i think it's also just good for people to know i'm having a hard time well shit i'm i need to you know go go somewhere for five days get out of your environment go (sighs) be with people that are there just strictly to help you get better to help you feel better Mm-hmm. and uh it's good to, it's just good you know that can be a preventative of suicide that For can sure. be preventative mm-hmm. of a lot of really bad thing depressing things and yeah. de- depression and stuff like that so yeah um, super important to talk about that that's cool to share your experience so there's a blueprint for people if they need to for sure that. i know for my sure. girlfriend wants to go there really bad yeah <laughs> so cool. i'll cool. talk to her about yeah. that um cool all right. Well, JP, I mean, this has been a really, really special conversation and, and it's been, it's been fucking awesome. So, so stoked to hear about the, the, the ballroom dancing, man. I can't <laughs> honesty too believe it. It's here. It was amazing, right? Thank you. I appreciate just everything that. you said. You yeah. shared mm-hmm. so much. Thank totally. You. Yeah. And you're just your whole career and what you've done for snowboarding, um, you know, from warriors to Kingpin Chronicles, to simple pleasures, decade, tech diff, resistance, true life, shakedown, chunk smack that. <laughs> Picture this, double decade, this video sucks. You know, your real street part, cheers, good luck, your two gibberish parts, 2032, video grass, Nixon jib fest, just iconic, iconic stuff. It's just been fucking so fun watching you do your thing. And, and um, you know, before we wrap this thing up, do you have any thank yous you want to throw out? I mean, there, there's kind of too many thank yous almost. And so right now, I just want to say thanks to you guys, um, most importantly. And um, I just appreciate what you guys have here and have created. And I'm really grateful to have come on and be able to share with you guys. And I've missed you guys. Missed you too. Yeah. And... I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, JP, for coming on the show. And uh, thank you so much to everybody that tuned in and listens. Um, We really appreciate you guys. And uh, over and out from the bomb hole.